The um, agenda for today is call to order, followed by items of interest, director's report, then we'll vote on the consent agenda. That'll be followed by the mixed use zones project briefing, and then that will be followed by a hearing for, on the TSP. If you're here to testify, please fill out forms in the back of the room and bring them up to Julie. And with that, and are there any items of interest? I look to you. Andre? I have nothing of interest. I would just note, I just yeah, happened yeah. to open our little magazine here and it actually has the city of Portland planning in it. Thanks for calling that to our attention, Andre. Any other items? Page 21. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, I just spent three days in Seattle and uh, the weather was fabulous, so that probably contributed to uh, what a wonderful, great time I had. I was really impressed. I stayed in Capitol Hill area. I was really impressed with the number and the quality, the design of um, multifamily and other developments that seemed to really fit in beautifully into those existing neighborhoods. I just think I thought about taking a bunch of photos and bringing them back, but at any rate, they're really impressed with what they're doing up there. Good to hear. Anything else? No? Susan? I just wanted to give you a little update on, uh, you remember, the comprehensive plan. Uh, just letting you know where it is with uh, City Council. And so uh, since it left all of you, uh, they've had five hearings, and you knew about that, and uh, thousands of comments, uh, both by letter, by email, and on the MAP app. Um, in February, we published a kind of preliminary list of amendments from uh, city council members. Um, since then, that list has now been finalized, although nothing's final until uh, we, we uh, have a, a round of hearings again and, and they will uh, potentially add additional amendments at that time or, or amend their amendments. Um, they've had... Uh, discussions um, with their staff, intense with our staff um, and uh, with each of the individual commissioners for hours, um, going into detail in both the policy issues and particular pro properties and particular uh, zoning uh, code uh, issues. So um, at this point, there are about 200 amendments. I'd say around half of those are sort of you know, just clean up, and about half are, are substantive in terms of um, issues that they wanted to uh, look at a little differently. I'd like to give all of you an opportunity to hear and talk a little bit more about those. Um, so at the officer's briefing on the, the 31st, um, we'll have an, uh, some time set aside during the meeting so you can um, ask any questions about the discussions that are going on uh, between the various council members at this time. So. Just wanted to give you a little update, and um, at this point, the next hearings are March, or uh, April 14th and April 20th. That may shift a bit. Uh, the mayor may uh, have to be out of town, so we're looking at the schedule, but definitely um, April 14th, and um, I think that's it. Questions? So if anyone's going to join us for that officer's briefing, just make sure to let Julie know so we can double check that we don't have a quorum. Uh, so next item is the consent agenda. Consideration of the minutes. Move to accept the minutes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. And now we've got the mixed use zone project. Good afternoon, commissioners, um, or evening, I should say. Um, Eric Engstrom with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Uh, here with me is uh, Barry Manning and Bill Cunningham, staff for the Mixed Use Project. Um, I'm gonna give a brief introduction. Um, Barry's gonna go over some of the basics of the proposal. Bill will get into a little bit more, especially of the design-related details, um, and then I'll come back at the end on a, on a few things. Um, and. We didn't talk about who will advance the slides, but I'll go ahead and do that. <laughs> um, 
you all um, were very involved in the creation of this diagram on the screen. It's the um, centers and corridors growth strategy diagram from the comprehensive plan. Um, that's really the, the core rationale behind this project to update the zoning that applies in those places. Um, as we discussed in the, um, in the comp plan um, work that you did, um, the outside of the, the biggest dot there is obviously the central city, which this project is not dealing with, but outside the central city, uh, about half of the growth um, over the next 20 years will occur in mixed use centers and corridors. So that's the impetus for why we want to look carefully at how those zones are performing and update them in light of the of what's happening on the ground in recent years. Um, it's been about 25 years since those um, previously called commercial zones now proposed as mixed use and commercial zones are um, have been overhauled. So um, the world has changed a lot in that 25 year period. Um, the uh, you also were involved in um, looking at a lot of the details, translating that conceptual diagram to the comp plan designations on the map. And if you'll recall, we had four comp plan designations within the mixed use areas, and those corresponded to those place types that were on the the growth framework. Um, at the top of the diagram are mixed use urban centers, which are town centers and the densest innermost corridors surrounding the central city. Next on the diagram are the civic corridors, which are our big, biggest, widest streets like 82nd and Sandy, Barber, um, where there's, because of the size of the street, there's some potential, and, and because of the era of previous development, there's quite a bit of redevelopment potential and placemaking potential. Um, next on the, on the list was the neighborhood mixed use areas, smaller scale than town centers, usually narrower streets. Um, but still some opportunity to create, um, to help us create 20 minute um, neighborhoods or complete communities where you can get more of your daily needs met uh, within walking distance of all of our different neighborhoods. Uh, and then at the bottom of the diagram is the, what we call the mixed use dispersed, which are recognizing that we have a lot of very small nodes of, of commercial and mixed use that still will exist outside of that framework and, and looking at, at the appropriate zoning for that. So that's the comp plan map framework for this. Um, we took that and then um, uh, crosswalked that to the zoning framework that Barry will go into just to, to orient you a little bit. Um, and those, so those comp plan designations are on their left and then the the implementing zones that are part of this proposal are in the next column. And the third column is other zones that are allowed in those designations. And that's recognizing that in many cases, um, we added comp plan designations to places that are zoned residential today or have some other designation. And we may not immediately want to flip that switch. And so there's, there's zones that are allowed to continue to exist within these designations, but that if you're coming in as an applicant and asking for a zone change, you can't ask for their, their legacy. Um, zones that are that are within those areas that we want to acknowledge. So, um, the dispersed areas are those small nodes, and the choice of zones there is just the small scale zone. Um, in the mixed use neighborhood, there's a slightly wider choice, and then in the civic corridor and urban center, you get the full possibility of of that spectrum of zones to allow, um, you know, depending on the context, at the edge of a town center or at the center of a town center, there may be different scales appropriate. Um, so that's, I just wanted to quickly show you that diagram and you'll maybe understand a little bit more after Barry goes through and explains what those, what those different zones mean. Um, and again, Barry will talk, orient you in the, the layout of the proposed zones and the bill will go into more of the, some of the design details and design standards. Uh, I want to also just address one question that's on everyone's mind very quickly. Um, you probably all noticed that inclusionary zoning was passed at the legislature recently. Um, this is the well, one of the most frequent questions I get right now is how does that affect the mixed use zones? And the, the first part of my answer is we don't really know because it just happened. Um, we're still working on that question. Um, the city is working on um, inclusionary zoning regulatory language on a fairly fast track, which is going to catch up and pass this mixed use project in process. So by the time this project is ready for your uh, approval, we will have some answers on that question, at least at the conceptual stage. Um, the third part of my answer is uh, it is very likely that the mixed use affordable housing bonuses will play some part in that overall framework. 
in that um, the, the state legislature requires us to um, provide some level of, of um, award or reward for, for a development that is required to um, participate in the inclusionary zoning. And that could take the form of tax um, benefits or, or SDC credits. But it's likely that the floor area bonuses in the mixed use code would play some role as an optional process for, for fulfilling those, those state requirements. So although we don't know really the answer, it's likely that this bonus system is part of that answer. I just wanted to kind of say that up front because there's going to be a lot of questions like that as we go through. So with that, I'm going to um, step back in again to the general and have Barry introduce more on the, the broad outline of, of the project. So Eric, before you step back, just to follow up on the IZ issue, do we know where in our big project program of task five and the things beyond that IZ will find its way into our considerations? We've been asked to bring something to council within six to nine months. So it, it's moving. It'll have to, to, to the extent it demands the zoning code, it will have to come through here. And, and we're working on that scheduling issue now. OK, thanks. So I'm Barry Manning. I'm a, a senior planner with the Bureau of Planning Sustainability and pr managing the mixed use zones project, uh, joined by Bill Cunningham, who's been integral to the staff. So what we wanted to do is walk you through the basic framework of the mixed use zones proposal. And uh, again, Bill will walk you through some of the design detail and then answer your questions at the end. I just want to remind folks that uh, we're in a briefing today. We did uh, brief you back in late 2014 or mid-2014 and then early 2015. I realized we had another work session with the Planning Commission. So you've seen this twice. The project's evolved quite a bit you know, over the last uh, year or two. Uh, some elements are the same, but some have changed considerably. So some of this will be new. Some of it won't. Um, we did release and publish, uh, just posted online today, by the way, the draft that we've given you uh, publicly. So this is what the public would be reviewing for code and map changes along with the map app that's online. And we have a uh, public hearing scheduled on this uh, topic on May 10th coming up. And then potentially a uh, continuation of that hearing on May 17th uh, if uh, if it's warranted. So that's where we're, what we're looking at in terms of process. So um, following up on what Eric's talked about a little bit, um, I want to just talk a little bit about the mixed use zones objectives and why we are undertaking this in a little more detail. Uh, Eric mentioned that we've got a new comp plan that really kind of reorganizes our thinking about development in centers and corridors. And the commercial mixed use zones are a key component of where a lot of new housing and uh, neighborhood uh, business and commercial development will occur. Uh, the last uh, set of zones that we have, the current set of zones that we have applied there were created in the late 80s or early 90s and that have been on the books quite a while and it's really time to refresh them. So what we're trying to do is create zones and supporting codes that respond better to the new comprehensive plan and urban design framework, uh, supporting that housing growth that we expect to have in the commercial development we need to have in those uh, centers and corridors. We're trying to address issues like building scale and transitions to neighborhoods and creating stronger retails and key locations that we want to foster as centers. We're trying to um, better address design and contextual issues with the new code, uh, integrating with local character where we can through the pattern array concepts. Uh, we've been testing uh, all along, um, both economically and, and architecturally, uh, the models for these mixed-use zones to make sure that they're um, not infeasible economically, that they're market-feasible uh, development and, and can be built in the different pattern areas where they're going to be applied. Uh, another one of the objectives here was to make sure that we supplied housing that's affordable for Portland income. So that's a range of incomes, and we've got some bonus uh, bonuses and incentives for development that we think address that, as, as Eric alluded to earlier, and we'll get into more detail on that. Um, we want to continue to allow for a variety of commercial and employment uses in these areas. So they're mixed-use zones, but they don't mean it doesn't mean that they all have to have housing in them. We want to make sure that commercial development is a key component of the mix, particularly in some key areas, and we'll talk about that in more in a minute. And then we wanted to consider, and the group considered equity implications of the approaches. So we were thinking about how do different choices we make with code or zoning approaches affect different communities, different populations. I uh, wanted to review some of the process highlights that we've been through. We've been involved in this process about two years now. Back in uh, winter of 2014, February of 2014, we formed a project advisory committee. Started off with about 28 members. A few of them uh, uh, shortened their stay after a, a long commitment through our concept plan. 
but uh, many of them stayed on, about uh, 20 folks stayed on, and uh, at least one of them uh, is with us in the audience tonight, and they were helpful in providing feedback and different perspectives on the, on the codes uh, that we were proposing, the ideas about zoning that we were proposing, and uh, uh, giving us perspectives on the different kind of neighborhood uh, and, and development perspectives that are out there. The committee actually had uh, community folks on it, neighborhood folks, uh, business folks, as well as folks from the architecture and development uh, community and uh, real estate industry on it as well. So it was a balanced and mixed group that gave us a variety of perspectives. We also formed a technical advisory group, which was made up of bureau uh, representatives that gave us perspectives on the diff from the different bureaus, BDS, uh, environmental services, PDC, uh, housing. Some of those folks uh, uh, and agencies are going to be partners, uh, particularly with the bonuses, so it was instrumental to have them on the group, and I know that uh, some of those folks are here in the room tonight as well. In terms of public process, early on in the process, we conducted seven neighborhood walks to get a sense from the community about what the issues that they were seeing were with mixed-use development, some of the new things that were happening, what they thought could be improved upon, so we took that input from the community and integrated that into our process. We also had Roundtable conversations with developers, architects, uh, business folks, and affordable housing uh, providers to find out what their perspectives on development were and how codes could change or things could change to uh, create a more well-rounded pr product that would serve multiple needs. Um, after some early formulations, we developed a preliminary concept, and I think that was the last time we talked to the Planning and Sustainability Commission. We had some workshops in that on that rather in fall of 2014. Uh, that gave us some more food for thought. We went back and revised it and kind of fleshed out that concept and uh, developed a revised uh, proposal concept that was published um, in, I think it was February or May of 2015. I'm sorry, it was published in May of 2015. We had an early release in, in uh, uh, winter and spring of that year and uh, had some uh, info sessions and, and workshops on that. Um, we did some additional work in terms of outreach with um, Residents and shoppers in mixed-use districts. We interviewed um, some folks that lived in mixed-use buildings and did a survey of some of their uh, desires, why they decided to live in buildings, what their car ownership characteristics were, how they traveled, and things of that nature, and also wanted to learn more about shoppers in the areas to find out what their impressions of mixed-use districts were. We completed that work in spring of 2015. That was uh, reaching out to several hundred folks. And then finally, we... Uh, produced a discussion draft, which was the predecessor to the proposed draft that you're looking at right now. That was published in September of 2015 and uh, out for comment until about November, and we received hundreds of comments on the discussion draft, uh, which were considered in uh, 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 composing the proposed draft. So there's been quite a bit of outreach over the last year and a half, two years on this project, and we've also met with you know, multiple different community organizations, neighborhood associations, district coalition offices, business associations over the course of this as well. So um, fair amount of public outreach. Um, so what are we doing in the z uh, mixed use zones project? Just a summary, a few slides here, framing it up for you. Uh, the mixed use zones project creates a new framework of mixed use zones. We're creating four new zones, CM1, CM2, CM3, and CE. I'll talk about those more in a minute. That results in a brand new zoning map that's completely different than the zoning map we have now, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. We, um, as part of this, we rewrote the entire uh, commercial mixed use base zone, which is section 33130 of the uh, zoning code. We have a new FAR structure with bonuses for all of the new zones and new development and design standards, which Bill will go into some detail on. Uh, we are creating a new center's Main Street overlay zone to be applied in some strategic uh, center locations throughout the city. That's designed to create more active pedestrian areas and more commercial areas. We're expanding the uh, area of the design overlay zone, applying that to all mixed use urban center areas, which are the close in neighborhoods where we expect to see most new development in the near term. Show you a map of that in a moment. And then we've got some new transportation requirements, um, some new transportation demand uh, uh, management requirements that we're proposing in um, 33266, which is the transportation parking and now transportation demand management section of the code, and um, some additional um, language about how uh, transportation uh, impact reviews would be conducted under 33A52, and I think you're going to hear more about those in the, um, uh, the presentation that follows this from transportation. 
So graphically, in a nutshell, what are we doing with the zones? This, these three diagrams kind of explain it. This is an example of what our existing zones might produce right now. And uh, we uh, essentially, this is a CS zone. And what it does is it allows development with residential development in a mixed use situation that extends to the maximum height limit of the zone and the setbacks of the zone. It doesn't regulate floor area for residential. It regulates floor area for commercial uses, but re residential is completely unregulated in the commercial zones right now for the most part. And so um, this is w the kind of development that you can achieve in the existing CS zone and some of the other ones. And um, one of the issues that we've heard about from neighborhoods is that the development is um, oftentimes too bulky, maybe doesn't have the right setbacks or transitions to neighborhoods. And so we looked at ways that we could try to facilitate those kinds of issues, but also provide um, for supply of affordable housing and maintain our housing capacity uh, in the project. So the new proposal actually um, changes the way we look at the floor area allowed in the mixed use zones. Uh, by including residential calculations in that floor area. It no longer exempts residential from the floor area calculations. And so what we've done is set new floor area levels for all of the zones that include residential, and that will uh, re result in different shapes of buildings. It won't, uh, no longer will allow buildings to be built out to the maximum height and bulk of the zone in an unregulated fashion. Um, and then in addition to regulating the FAR on these sites, we've also added new development related standards for things like enhanced ground floor windows, for uh, open space for residents of mixed use buildings. We've introduced some uh, modest articulation and building massing regulations that break up the massing a little bit more than they do currently. So um, Bill will talk in more detail about, detail about those, but what the, the nutshell of this is that the zones are, are further shaped by our new regulations than they were previously. And then we're adding an opportunity for bonuses and incentives that would allow additional development above that entitled development that I just showed you. So in a bonus situation, you could add floor area and in some situations height by providing some public benefits. And the public benefits that we've defined uh, in this project are for affordable housing and affordable commercial space. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. But that's the idea behind this is that we'll, um, again, um, go from something that's fairly unregulated to something that sets an allowed amount of development by right and then says that if you do uh, something with your development that provides public benefits, you can do some more. So the four zones that we've created are shown here. Um, the smallest scale one is called Commercial Mixed Use One, or CM1. It has a height limit proposed of 35 feet and a basic floor area allowance of 1.5 to 1. And with bonuses, it would still be limited to 35 feet, but could go up to 2.5 to 1 FAR, so you could gain floor area by providing some of those public benefits. And this zone, uh, would be applied in those smaller scale dispersed and neighborhood areas primarily. It would replace the existing uh, neighborhood commercial one and two zones and the small scale office commercial one zone, which are all right around that same size, 30 foot height limit currently, going up to 35 to allow three floors of mixed use development. We're creating a new commercial mixed use two zone, which is essentially a four story zone uh, with a 45 foot height limit in most locations with a 2.5 to one FAR floor area ratio. Um, it is bonusable up to 55 feet in some locations, so five stories and a four to one FAR with the bonuses. And that zone would be replacing our existing commercial storefront CS zone, our existing commercial mixed use zone, which is CM zone, not applied very broadly, but the commercial storefront is, and our existing office commercial two zone, which is a larger scale office zone. Um, that's pretty broadly applied zone in many of the um, inner neighborhoods of Portland and some of the areas in outer Portland as well. The next zone that we're creating is a commercial mixed use three. Uh, it is essentially, uh, has a base of uh, six stories or 65 feet with a three to one FAR, uh, which is bonusable up to 75 feet in a five to one FAR. And this zone would replace um, in areas outside of the central city, um, the current central employment zones, EX, which also has a three to one FAR and 65 foot high limit and the current CX zone outside of the central city, which is a 75-foot uh, height limit and a four-to-one FAR. So that's our large-scale mixed-use zone. And then finally, we're creating a commercial employment zone. Um, it's a four-story zone, maximum height as well, with a 2.5-to-one base FAR. 
uh, bonusable up to three to one FAR. And the commercial employment zone is a zone that would allow more auto accommodating development. It still allows housing and other mixed use and commercial development, but would be less of an emphasis on housing and, and uh, lacking the bonuses for housing that the other zones have. Um, and it would generally replace our existing general commercial zone, which is applied uh, largely in East Portland and in some lim limited locations in inner Portland neighborhoods. So those are the four zones that we're introducing. And um, some uh, a really simplified use chart here just shows you that um, all of them allow housing to some degree. All of them allow industrial uses, light industrial uses to some degree. All of them allow institutional uses to some degree. And in terms of commercial uses, the CM1, because of its small scale nature and its application oftentimes in neighborhood, has a limitation on the size of retail and office uses when it's applied in a uh, small context on small lots. The CM2 and CM3 have a much broader array of uses in the commercial categories, uh, typical of the CS zone, so a very broad array. And the commercial employment zone has a broad array of commercial uses as well, but has uh, much more uh, of an allowance for auto-oriented development. So the gas stations, um, quick vehicle servicing, oil change uh, locations, and drive through restaurants, those types of uses would be allowed in the commercial employment zone, but not in the other zones. So these uh, next slides just show you a little bit graphically of some models of what the zones would produce in terms of their maximum uh, building envelope. Okay, so on the top you see the um, CM1 with no bonus. On the bottom, the CM1 maximum with bonus. And this is just kind of a rendering of what that would look like. So on the right is no bonus and on the left bonus. So a little bit bulkier with the bonus. In the medium sized zone, the top shows no bonus and the bottom shows what that could be built out with bonus. And then a rendering kind of what those would look like uh, potentially in the neighborhood context. So the right hand side without bonus and the left hand side with bonus. The CM3, the largest zone on the top would be what's potentially buildable without bonuses and on the bottom what could be built potentially with a bonus. And then again, what they might look like in context, the right-hand side being the base and the left-hand side being the base with the bonus. And then finally, the commercial employment zone, uh, much more of a uh, office-oriented zone and less of a housing zone on the top, uh, the maximum without bonus and the bottom, the maximum with bonus, and a couple of examples of what that might look like in context. This could also include much lower scale development and they all could include less development, but we wanted to show you what the maximum envelopes generally look like. So I've mentioned uh, base and bonus quite a few times and, and our, um, our two-tiered FAR system. And we are proposing bonuses that for public benefits that would allow you to increase that floor area and height in some cases. And the bonuses, uh, previously we had quite a bit of longer lists. We've done quite a bit of economic modeling and testing on these and, and really refined the list down to bonuses that focus primarily on affordability elements as the public benefit that we're trying to achieve with the additional floor area. So we're proposing that one of the uh, bonuses be for affordable housing units and one would achieve up to 100% of the achievable uh, floor area bonus by providing 25% of the bonus floor area in housing that's available to folks that make 80% of the median family income. The second bonus would be affordable commercial space. This is the idea that uh, as new development is occurring, we're often seeing dramatic change in the commercial uh, landscape of neighborhoods and we want to provide opportunities for uh, smaller scale uh, 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 shops and services that might not be able to afford the rents in newer development. So this would provide additional uh, floor area for commercial space that le is leased up at below market rent and you could earn up to 50% of the bonus floor area by providing such space. And then, sure. Um, what was the length of time for affordability that that was based on? The, the affordable housing, we're assuming a 60 year commitment on affordability and a 20 20-year commitment, I think, is what we've proposed on the affordable commercial space. Okay. So longer time frames. These, by the way, are elements that we're still in the process of refining. We, we would partner with the Portland Housing Bureau and Portland Development Commission on the housing and commercial space bonuses, respectively. Uh, we anticipate developing administrative rules with those agencies so that they could ad help administer these bonuses. Um, the document actually talks a little bit about how we perceive that to, to happen, that a developer that wanted to pursue one of these bonuses would engage with the 
uh, Development Commission or Housing Bureau enter into a program that uh, was set up to um, and to uh, uh, monitor these uh, types of developments, and then they would take a certificate of compliance to BDS in their permitting process to be allowed the additional floor area. Um, but we are still working through that process and expect to have more progress on that by the time the public hearings with the Planning Commission happen, and then further development of the administrative rules by the time we get to City Council on this. So the third way to uh, gain additional floor area um, in addition to those bonuses are through transfers of floor area from historic resources, and you can transfer up to 50%, uh, I'm sorry, you can transfer floor area and earn up to 50% of the bonus amount by doing that. So one could transfer from a historically uh, designated property and add that to the base zone to increase your floor area, and we think this, this is a tool that might uh, allow for greater preservation of properties in the area. Um, before you, just real quick, um, the 80%, is that to match the inclusionary zoning requirement? It wasn't intended to match that, but it does match that at this point in time. Okay. It's it's based on economic modeling of what's feasible and uh, because a bonus has to be an incentive or no one would use it, so we have to figure out what would, we have to calibrate the bonus so that it's it's attractive for someone to use. Um, I, and it, it just... So we we will get a discussion at some later point about that point of 80%. Okay, great. Yeah, these were modeled economically just very briefly twice, once early on by Johnson Economics, and then uh, again more recently by Eco Northwest. We really looked carefully at you know what type of uh, uh, level of uh, affordability and how much in terms of units and how much floor area really work in terms of providing an incentive. The, the incentive is the uh, developer would be earning additional floor area in exchange for these provision of affordable housing units or affordable commercial space. And there's a balance there that we need to strike on that. And 80% MFI looks like the right balance on the housing number and 25% uh, looks like about the right balance on the um, affordable commercial. And we'll have, we're have we waiting on a final document from Eco Northwest, which we'll share with you that provides more detail on how that analysis worked. Should I interpret this that a floor area ratio couldn't be transferred over unless there's a sort of, like, if someone's just not using their density on an adjoining property, could they transfer FAR over to? They, they could if it was a historic resource. Only if it was a historic resource. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Another development incentive we're proposing in the new uh, package is a what we're calling a plan development bonus. Initially, we called it a large site master plan, and uh, this would allow taller buildings and bonus floor area on large sites of two acres or more when they're approved through a type three land use review with the design commission. Uh, and as part of that proposal, the requirements for development would be that um, they would need to provide affordable housing at that 80% MFI level at the prescribed level that the bonus calls for, 25% of the bonus floor area. It would require a public open space, 15% of the site area. It would require low carbon buildings, uh, lead gold standard buildings, and then design review would be required on those buildings. And the idea here is that some of the floor area that we're allowing, even in the base uh, floor area, let alone the bonuses, can't really be achieved with the height limits that are allowed by the zones, uh, particularly on large sites where you have to accommodate parking and circulation and other needs. Additional height will allow you to maximize that floor area. And in community conversations, uh, folks felt that on larger sites where you had the opportunity to really kind of taper down the development to fit more into the neighborhood context and kind of uh, mass things differently, that additional height might be okay with them. So we're proposing to allow that, but only through this Type 3 land use review. Um, looking at a lot of roof space out there, um, where do, where do eco-roofs come into the equation? Hang on just a second. Bill's going to tell you. Okay. Yeah. I have a quick question sure. for the previous slide. Um, so I, I saw it was 25% below market rate for commercial. For the commercial, right? yes. Okay. And then is this only applying to more inner, like the affordable housing study? I guess you're going to go into it later, but I was curious if that was more centrally located. What we found in the economic modeling is that it really only works where the additional floor area has, has value for the developer. And right now that happens to be in inner Portland market areas. So um, some of our modeling indicated areas within, you know, um, more central to the city from 60th Avenue, for instance, on the east side, or some closer in west side neighborhoods. 
maybe out to as far as St. John's would would have the potential to take advantage of these bonuses. Other areas in town just not ripe for that yet. So um, I'm going to show you a zoning map and a couple of more slides before I hand it over to Bill. Um, we, as I said, we have a new zoning map. It was created in a kind of a multi-step process. And what we tried to do, we didn't intentionally go out to up zone or down zone uh, significantly. We, as you may have heard in the comprehensive plan discussions, that we have uh, quite a bit of zoned capacity and we can accommodate most of our future development for the next, for the 20 year planning horizon without really changing densities a lot. So we try to create a zoning map that really um, uh, gives you the closest match in terms of development standards and intensity as the existing zoning does with some uh, exceptions. So we created a conversion table, which I'm showing you an example of that created the basis for our first new mixed use zones zoning map. And what it did was it um, applied the new zones based on the proposed comprehensive plan designation, which you see on the left, and the existing zone that you see in the uh, call or the, uh, the row at the top of the table. So if you had, for instance, a CS zone, which is a medium-sized existing zone, and you were in a mixed-use neighborhood area, comp plan area, you ended up with a CM2 zone. If you had an existing general commercial zone, a CG zone, and you were in a mixed-use civic corridor area, in most cases, you ended up with the CE zone, the equivalent of the CG zone. The one exception to this is where we had CE zones that were intersecting or overlapping with uh, areas that were designated as centers, we went for the more urban or pedestrian-oriented zone rather than the auto-oriented zone. So in that instance, rather than going to CE, we went to CM2 in that particular case. So that generated the first iteration of that map. And then we worked with additional staff from the district liaison team and other folks to create a more refined uh, map based on their specific knowledge of the area and community input. And I know you can't read this very well at this scale, but this is the proposed zoning map. And what you can see from this map, though, is that um, in many of the inner ring neighborhoods, you'll see this darker red colored zoning. That's the CM3. So you can see, for instance, this is Sandy Boulevard leading out to the Hollywood District. Most of that is the CM3 zone. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, a lot of CM3 there. Interstate, a lot of CM3 there replacing EX, for instance. Northwest, parts of that are EX currently. So CM3 applied in areas like that. This goldenrod color is the CM2 zone. So you can see, for instance, on uh, Division Street, Hawthorne, and Belmont, where there's existing CS zone, it's been uh, replaced with the proposed CM2 zone. And you can see, for instance, in East Portland, in these darker brown color areas, these are existing areas that are uh, general commercial. This is Eastport Plaza, for instance, or up in Park Rose. And we're proposing to replace many of those with the existing CE zone uh, in those locations. Eric mentioned the dispersed areas and I mentioned the CM1 zone and those are applied in some of these outer very small areas on the periphery and at the edges of our centers and uh, edges of places like Hollywood or in St. John's. Barry, um, yeah. be before you keep going, mm -hmm. for some of the folks on uh, the commission, they're new. Mm -hmm. And then this is all alphabet soup, I'm sure, right now, just letters <laughs> and flying. And even those of you words. who have been on for a long time, <laughs> could you talk a little bit Learn about um, the purpose behind this in terms of increasing the number of units versus increasing the clarity and ease and improving, improving the ultimate design and what it looks like on the ground. Because I think there were three different things to look at. Yeah. Um, and if you were just walking into this, you might just think this was all about almost upzoning. And that's not what this was about. And right. so maybe talk about those three points, um, units and density, uh, clarity in general, and uh, looking at design and the shape of the building. Sure. Um, in terms of density, there, there isn't a, a drastic as I, talked about earlier, drastic changes in density on this. Uh, we're still not regulating uh, the number of units in mixed use developments, which is very similar to the way we do it today. So it's really a market choice about how many units one puts into the building, but we do include residential in that floor area calculation, as I mentioned earlier. So the overall building envelope, when we look at what's allowed, residential is a part of that mix. And currently, it's not a part of that mix. So that goes a little bit to that predictability idea. Right now, um, you might have a neighborhood commercial zone, CM, CN1, excuse me, that has a 0.75 to 1 FAR, which is less than uh, 1 to 1. So you can only build uh, on a 10,000 square foot lot 
that would allow 7,500 square feet of, for instance, commercial space. But the height limit in that zone is 30 feet, and there are very uh, limited setbacks in the zone. So in, in today's zoning code, one could build residential up to that 30-foot maximum and out to the extent of the zone, so much bigger than that 0.75 to 1 FAR would allow. In the new framework, we're saying the FAR with residential is 1.5 to 1, so you have a more predictable outcome in terms of how much, how big the development's going to be overall. There's less of a wild card element in that, and a little bit more predictability for the neighborhood, we think. Um, this also um, helps to, I think, shape uh, the design of buildings. We're using floor area to help shape design of buildings. One of the issues we heard about quite a bit was the mass and bulk of buildings. I showed you that large, bulky building uh, or model uh, earlier. And rolling, uh, resetting the floor area and rolling residential into the floor area allows a little bit more sculpting of buildings. We're no longer allowing the buildings to be built the floor area doesn't allow the buildings to be built out to the envelope. So that's one measure of shaping buildings uh, and in design. And then we've got some additional things that Bill's going to talk about that really further shape design through setbacks and articulation. Does that answer the question for you? So let me go quickly through these because I know we're on a limited time budget here. If I could find the right button. So, um, Eric mentioned earlier, we've got these four zones and we have a new comprehensive plan situation where we have uh, a comprehensive plan designation that might allow more than one zone within it. I'm just showing you this because we are looking at how would you make a decision about allowing a zone change from one zone to another one within a existing comprehensive plan designation. So quasi-judicial zone changes through a land use review will be allowed, and we're setting up um, more specific locational characteristics uh, within the characteristic statements about these zones so that one could make a decision about if the zone is appropriate to be applied in a particular situation through a quasi-judicial review. For instance, one of the things the characteristic statement says about the CM3 zone, the largest zone, is that it ought not be applied in areas where you're abutting single-dwelling residential. So we really don't want to see that zone applied in, in neighborhood, small neighborhood context. So we've built some of that in for, um, for, the, for the zone change opportunities. So a couple other things. I mentioned earlier that we're creating a center's Main Street overlay. This is really trying to create centers of activity and neighborhood nodes of focus uh, in the centers that have been approved in the comp plan. And what this Main Street overlay zone would do is require active uh, commercial ground floor uses in these areas. That provides a little bit of height flexibility um, so that we can get high ceiling ground floor commercial uses like grocery stores might need in the context of a mixed use development. Our current height limits are pretty limiting in that regard. It calls for more ground floor windows uh, than would be required in the base zone, which Bill will talk about in a minute. We're talking about uh, requiring stronger uh, street orientation building requirements in these areas. Minimum FAR so that we have more of a built up environment here and limiting and prohibiting uh, non-pedestrian uses in these particular areas. So where are we talking about applying those? These are the centers that were approved through the comp plan. Those are uh, some 20 odd centers throughout uh, Portland that are f focuses of neighborhood activity. And this overlay zone would be applied within very limited areas within all of those centers. So these blue areas represent the areas that that overlay zone would be applied. Centers of centers, centers, of centers yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier we're expanding the design overlay zone. These red areas show you where you're, where we are expanding that in the mixed use urban center area. Um, you can't see it very well on this map, but these gray areas are areas where it's the design overlay zone is currently applied. And in the mixed use inner ring neighborhoods in the mixed use urban center area, which I'm circling here with my pen, uh, many of those areas already have it. MLK, Interstate, Hollywood, Sandy Boulevard, St. John's, many of those areas already have design overlay zones applied. But one of the key areas where the uh, design overlay zone that is now in mixed use urban center designation, uh, where the design overlay zone was not applied, are the inner southeast Main Street. So um, Burnside, Belmont, Hawthorne Division would now be um, subject to the design overlay zone as mixed use urban center neighborhoods, as would areas around 122nd and Division and Outer Barber, since those are mixed use urban center town centers in the new framework. 
those are also the areas that would be eligible for that fifth story in the medium scale zone in the CM2 zone. So I talked about that, that it's in some places you would be able to go up to five stories in the medium scale zone. We have allowed it in those areas because we felt the design overlay zone gave uh, the oversight necessary to allow the larger buildings in those areas. I should have mentioned earlier on that the CM3 zone, the largest one, would always have a design overlay zone much like the current EX and CX zones do now. And finally, we're proposing to remove the buffer overlay zone from commercial properties. Uh, we are building in buffer-like requirements in the new commercial mixed-use base zones, and we feel that these are redundant, so we're removing those from the, um, uh, from the map. Uh, another area of mapping that I think you'll uh, want to make note of is uh, an area that we're calling low-rise commercial storefront areas. This is a... Uh, proposal that was in response to community interest in preserving the lower rise scale of many of the neighborhood main streets around Portland. We had a lot of testimony uh, both at council on the on the uh, comp plan and in the mixed use zones project uh, comments about concerns about uh, allowances for four and five story buildings where there's lots of one and two story scale buildings and intact resources on these neighborhood areas. So we looked at what um, we could do to um, address this issue and we identified concentrations of uh, one and two story streetcar era storefront buildings that were scattered throughout many neighborhood center areas throughout the city. Uh, these are stretches of uh, neighborhood commercial buildings that are what Bill likes to call shoulder to shoulder. They're right up to the street. They often have storefront windows. They're often in older buildings and they have a certain uh, character that that are really help identify those neighborhoods. And what we're proposing is zoning that would help uh, retain those and uh, improve the uh, infill context in those areas by limiting the height. We looked around the city for areas with these characteristics and the characteristics we were looking for are concentrations again of one and two story streetcar era storefront buildings uh, with a two block or 400 foot length or more. And again, look at a neighborhood centers and we've identified those on this map with these red dots. So you can see them in places like Alberta, uh, areas along uh, 28th and Burnside, thank you Bill, Belmont, uh, Hawthorne, Division, Woodstock, some in Roseway, some in Park Rose, that have these characteristics. And one might say, well, there's lots of these buildings around Portland, but we were really looking specifically for areas that had at least two blocks worth of them. So those included those places and places like Multlumba Village and, and areas in Selwood as well. And so what we're proposing to do there is limit the height to 35 feet for those core areas and while still allowing the height of the medium intensity 45 and 55 foot CM2 zone around there. So you can think of it as like the old town within the context of these neighborhood centers, trying to uh, provide some emphasis on those and some contextual zoning for those areas to, to, to maintain that scale in those areas with growth happening around them. And there are places like Multnomah Village, Moreland, Selwood, Belmont, as I said, Hawthorne and Division, Woodstock, Montevilla, Foster, Alberta, Northeast 28th, Park Rose, and Roseway. And the regular, regulatory approach we're proposing there is to apply the CM1 zone, which is the small scale zone. It has the 35 foot height, but through the overlay zone, all these areas are within the overlay area. We would allow additional FAR, more appropriate for the scale of those buildings, allow greater allowances for the retail and commercial uses in these buildings than we would in the base zone, and then allow things like full lot coverage, so 100% lot coverage, and not require landscaping in these particular areas. We also have some uh, zoning map uh, changes in employment areas. And the idea here is that uh, rather than going to the CM3 zone, which we would normally go to uh, from EX in the new mixed use zones uh, proposal, we wanted to uh, address issues of existing industrial uses that had parking and truck movement kind of issues that we didn't want to displace and encourage more, uh, more near-term mixed-use redevelopment on. So we looked at an employment zone that might be more appropriate to apply to those. Uh, and we are applying, we're proposing to apply EG1 to a series of these places to um, maintain their employment characteristics in the short term until redevelopment for mixed use is more appropriate down the road. And those are places like uh, Northwest District along the freeway, uh, I-405, 
areas along uh, northeast broad, north and northeast Broadway in uh, uh, between MLK and uh, Vancouver Williams, areas in between Sandy Boulevard and the Banfield, a couple of pockets here. Um, this is the um, Pepsi site, for instance, and this is the area around KATU. And that is all of them. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill to talk about development standards. I'll try to be brief about this, uh, maybe five minutes to allow you time for questions. Uh, as Barry is mentioning, we're, besides the, the broad approaches, we have some more detailed development standards. And I wanted to relay some of the, the high points of what we're doing. Uh, a comprehensive plan uh, approach that's part of the policy was that generally having some linkage between the scale of the street and, and the scale of buildings. And one way we're approaching that is on the ma major civic corridors like MLK or Sandy, allowing CM3, the big zone, as one of the loud zones and, and not having that provision in smaller shoes like Alberta. But another approach is related to where we do have the big CM3 zone, which allows at base six stories, uh, having some relationship between the, the building and that uh, the narrower two-lane main streets. Uh, the diagrams I have here are showing uh, diagonal what's essentially a solar access plane at the equinox in March and uh, in fall. And uh, it's indicating that a four-story scale there on the left, uh, and even going to a five-story with a step back, which we're looking at calling for uh, for the bonus fifth story, uh, preserves solar access on the north side of the street uh, when you have an east-west street. Um, on the far right, where you can have a six-story building on a wider, typically more four-lane street without app, uh, impacting that solar access on the other side of the street. Where you run into issues is where you have the six-story buildings on a narrow two-lane uh, street. So what we're proposing to do to address that, that concern about scale and solar access is requiring uh, buildings or portions of buildings above the fifth story on the, in the CM3 zone and the narrow streets to step back. Uh, this is just uh, showing some of the solar access modeling we did uh, for the medium CM2 scale zone. And it's, you can just make out the shadows there uh, during the equinox, showing that both the four-story and the five-story model are preserving access on the north side of the street to, to, uh, to the solar. Uh, some other things we're doing that are responding to the concerns about building scale are we're proposing that larger buildings have their facades broken up, broken up into smaller components. One way is a, a requirement that 25% of the facade of these larger buildings be offset from the primary facade. And you could do that through a variety of means. Some examples are there in the upper right. Um, there's a lot of community interest in stepping back the, the fourth story in our medium zones uh, because our CM2 applies in such broad types of areas like Northwest 23rd or Woodstock, uh, our proposal is to make that upper level step back above the third story more of an option versus a requirement. We're also proposing a limitation on building length to, to 200 feet, which corresponds to the traditional uh, Portland block structure. It's more of an issue in some areas outside the central city where you have block lengths that are 460 feet or longer. Uh, some community concerns about having a full block length in those areas. And our, uh, one of our proposals is to require that that building length be limited to 200 feet, at least within 20 feet of the street lot line. So you'd have to create a, a break in a larger building. Another part of the proposal is requiring uh, building heights to step down to lower density residential zones. We have this in some plan districts and overlays, but uh, have not had it broadly across the city. And this would uh, require that uh, for the, the 25 feet adjacent to a residential zone, you'd need to step down to a scale that's similar to the residential zone allowance. Um, if it's single family zoning, you'd need to step down to 35 feet. Uh, there are also uh, requirements for deeper landscape buffers adjacent to residential zones, some uh, greater limitations and balconies in that 10 foot setback area. And uh, in the zones that allow it, there are limitations on drive throughs with, uh, uh, in areas adjacent to the residential zoning. Uh, one topic that's uh, uh, come to the fore in some discussions is what happens when you have the full block zoning. Uh, an example there in the image is showing uh, MLK, but you also have the situation in 82nd where there's a full block of a uh, commercial mixed use zoning. There's been questions as to what happens in the backside of, of that block. We have some regulations that require a step down in the height in those situations across a local service street from residential areas. We have a, 
uh, lesser requirements for setbacks for residential zone uh, for residential buildings in the mixed use zone to encourage residential buildings to be part of the transition uh, on that full block. And it, you see that some in places like Mississippi or MLK where you've got residential on the backside of the block. And uh, similarly here too, some limitations on drive through uses uh, in that back portion of a, a full block zoned area. One thing we heard uh, in common from a, a bunch of stakeholders was the importance of the ground floor in terms of the design of a building and creating a successful place. Uh, ground floor window coverage is, is one thing we're addressing. Our current requirement is uh, buildings have to have at least 25% window coverage on, on transit streets, which is, is actually very suboptimal when you look at a lot of the traditional storefronts. We're proposing to bump that window coverage requirement up to 40% on uh, primary transit corridors. And in the center's overlay, in those key core commercial areas, uh, that percentage would be 60% window coverage. And the diagrams give you some sense for what those minimum window coverage requirements would be. Uh, um, yes? Are, are those maximum, the 40 and 60%? No, those are minimums. Okay. So this is because I, I know nothing about construction. Um, windows, would that potentially, particularly if you don't have any requirements about the type of windows, could that potentially decrease energy efficiency of new buildings and construction? It, it would be a considered concern, but a, a trade-off in the community conversations was that at that ground level, that getting the ground level right was, was pretty important to making these mixed use zones work. Is there, I mean, is there any potential to start putting in additional incentives or requirements that new, I mean, some of these new constructions, new con the new construction would be required to be more energy efficient windows? Well, they already have to meet certain energy codes by code. Yeah, okay. So even just by adding the windows, they're still gonna have to meet those energy codes and do other things such as up insulation or things to offset the fact that they maybe have a loss through the window. So I, think, I think we're covered. Uh, there are also options we have for substituting lease portions of the um, uh, the ground floor window coverage requirements by things like uh, public art, so you could uh, do less window coverage if you're you're at least doing something with the facade uh, that meets some of the uh, racks requirements. Um, we have another approach in areas where we don't require ground floor commercial. We have a, a series of options for ground floor residential. Currently, ground floor residential is exempt from window coverage requirements, uh, but we are often ending up with situations where uh, ground floor residential is built right up to the sidewalk and the windows are eyeball to eyeball level with uh, pedestrians, uh, which has resulted in concerns about how that interface works. And the options we're providing are either the ground floor residential could be designed as flexible space that could be readily converted to uh, commercial if uh, right now they, uh, the market doesn't support it. Uh, so you need the storefront type windows and at grade uh, entrances, or you could set back um, behind landscaping to provide uh, a horizontal buffer or step uh, the, the unit up above the grade of the sidewalk. Yes. I had a question about that. So in, in um, multi-use, that doesn't mean that they have to have um, commercial on the ground floor or does it? Uh, only in the center's overlay area would we be requiring commercial requiring commercial at the ground floor. Okay, so I mean in East Portland, the um, some of the streets we'd like to have a lot more commercial, and yet with all the pressure to build um, housing right now, I'm afraid that um, if it's not required, we might not get it and that opportunity would be lost. Uh, our center's overlay does apply to places in East Portland, like 122nd and Division or Park Rose, and in those locations, we, we are gonna be requiring a commercial uh, a ground floor component. We wanna make sure the centers were guaranteed to have some commercial at the ground floor. The, the issue is that we still have over 100 miles of Main Street and commercial zoning, and there's just not enough market to potentially absorb all that. But mm -hmm. we felt that at least being strategic about it, we would get it in the most key places. But you did hear from the community on this, right? And you did hear that they wanted that. Yeah. Yes, and yeah, I think that played into the center's overlay discussions. Uh, and we do have some standards that do vary some between the inner and uh, 
eastern and western neighborhoods. Uh, the, the slide I have here uh, is highlighting the fact that some of our development standards are going to vary by area of the city. Generally, we have allowances for greater building coverage in the inner neighborhoods where you already have the tradition of the shoulder to shoulder buildings, pretty hardscape, um, and higher requirements are, are for landscaping and less building coverage in some of the eastern and western areas that have more of a, a valued characteristic of the more vegetated environment. Um, one thing that is changing, however, is in our inner neighborhoods currently, our CS and EX zones have a 0% requirement for landscaping, so no landscaping is required. And we are proposing a, a new approach where uh, landscaping or a series of green options would be required in the CM2 and CM3 zones, even in the inner neighborhoods. And this responds to a community input we received, also comp plan policies that call for integrating green elements into the urban environment. And what we're proposing in these more urban inner neighborhood zones is uh, besides the option that usually applies of 15% in ground landscaping, which could be difficult to achieve if you're doing high lot coverage, you could also uh, achieve it through doing eco roofs or uh, some other options where a smaller percentage of land area, if you did set aside a larger chunk of land for a, a large canopy tree, uh, or you could do raised landscaped areas, say above a parking podium that currently would not meet landscaping requirements to meet that, and also allowing uh, pervious pavers to meet a portion of the landscape requirement. So allowing more flexibility for these urban models, but still calling for a green component as part of development. It's so, so I loosely wasn't quite, based. I wasn't quite finished, actually. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure that you realize that the difference between East Portland and the rest of the Portland is very different in terms of what they require from mixed use development. It's very different. So I'm just wondering how much those um, issues came into this plan. We, um, in a couple different ways, the um, one aspect of the work was to do economic modeling of different scenarios in different lot situations, and we did a bunch of work both with inner and outer neighborhoods to see how that would play out. Mm -hmm. um, the urban design team also um, do, drew, did scenario drawings showing how the code would play out on different lot sizes that are predominant in outer versus inner. Um, so the, the, um, the landscaping issue is one example of how the code is structured differently for the different parts of Portland. Mm -hmm. um, the centers will play out differently Primarily, the center's overlay will help ensure there is commercial in some of those core areas in East Portland. Mm -hmm. um, the other place where it's, uh, it plays out differently is in some of the, um, the large site requirements, which would happen, would get triggered more often in East Portland. So there are, we did pay a lot of attention to that and, and looked at how that code structure would play out. So, so you, I guess, well, just uh, one more question is just that, did you look at what is happening now because of the conditions are changing so rapidly that I'm wondering if your economic modeling still holds. We've, we've done a couple rounds of it, it twice now, and the most recent round is, is um, just a few months old. So we, we feel pretty good about that. Katie, I'd really like to be able to go over that with you because I know that um, one of our desires before we did the economic modeling was to be able to provide more opportunities for you know, storefront in areas that didn't have it. And, Absolutely. And yet, I'm, yeah, I'm and yet our worry about. was there's nothing worse than requiring something and then having those storefronts go empty because there's not enough economic demand. And so our desire was to go that direction, and this caused us to pull back a little bit. So I'd love to go through it with you, and mm -hmm. we can continue to talk about it and see if, and if actually, we're right or we're wrong. And that sounds like something that other people in East Portland would, be, would like to. I mean, that would be a good presentation to make to the community, not just to me. I'm going to move on here from the green options. Uh, something that does directly relate to East Portland and West is uh, on the large civic corridors such as Barber or, or 122nd or Outer Division, uh, we're proposing a minimum 10-foot front setback in, on those streets, and that's partially to provide more space for, for pedestrians on these very busy streets, also a little bit more separation from some of the negative impacts of uh, the big streets. There's also a lot of community interest, including some green elements on the street frontage and along these streets, people seeing it as part of the character of, of eastern Portland as well as, as west. 
Um, another new component of this plan is uh, since so much development in these zones includes residential, there's no requirement right now for res outdoor space in association residential units. We're proposing 40 square feet per unit, which could be private balconies or shared space or even indoor shared space. Um, and this corresponds to requirements we have in some of our multifamily zones. Uh, something that also has a relationship to the, the, the retail in East Portland is uh, I should note that our zoning for auto accommodating development that, that allows drive throughs uh, it's less broadly mapped than in the past. The CE zone replacement for CG is less broadly mapped than um, the current CG. Uh, but we're also uh, uh, mindful of the fact that uh, some of these large sites, especially common in East Portland, uh, need a, a treatment that's somewhat different from the, the little lots you have in the inner neighborhoods. Uh, so some of the provisions include more flexibility for uh, building and parking location on large sites. Uh, when you're looking at a, a multi-acre, say, shopping center site, trying to make all the setback requirements and building location requirements work, it's pretty problematic. And we've built in some flexibility. There's some current large retail options that provide flexibility for uh, buildings with 100,000 or, or square feet or more, and we're reducing that qualifying threshold to 60,000. Um, uh, we also, uh, in terms of drive-throughs, fewer zones allow drive-throughs. Uh, in the CM2 and CM3 zones, where dr new drive-throughs are prohibited, though, we're we have provisions that would allow existing drive-throughs to be rebuilt. Um, another uh, provision is for the east and western centers, our minimum development intensity or floor area ratios are lower than in the inner areas and partially to accommodate the, the types of uh, retail that are more common in those areas. Uh, we're pretty uh, sensitive to the fact that retail is needed in, in uh, certain areas in East Portland, and we don't have our regulations to be barriers to to getting retail developed. Um, a few other things are we have a liberalizing allowances for exterior display areas uh, and vendor carts, which right now most of our zones don't allow, notwithstanding the fact that you see them in front of hardware stores. Um, hopes uh, that this will make it easier for some low cost entry into businesses uh, with uh, models that uh, that have more of an open component to them. We're liberalizing options for sh commercial and shared parking. There's a lot of community interest in encouraging arrangements where a parking structure or parking area could serve multiple users and we're, we're making it easier to do those kinds of arrangements. There's a lot of community interest in making sure we have some dialogue opportunities between developers and neighbors and we're expanding neighborhood contact to the commercial mixed use zones and it would apply to most development. Uh, we currently have those requirements in the multifamily zones but not for uh, similarly sized for larger development in the mixed use zones. Before we move on I just wanted to address uh, Katie's questions about East Portland as well. We did have um, a couple of members from East Portland on our committee. We had Lori Boyson of the uh, Midway uh, Business um, NPI there. So she was on our committee. And we had Tim Bruner, who I think is associated with the East Portland Chamber of Commerce with, and as an architect in the area on our committee as well. We did meet with the East Portland uh, East Portland Action Plan Economic Development Subcommittee and had a couple of meetings with them over the course of the project too. So we did do some outreach and you know we wanted to, I wanted to uh, just mention that as a that we were thinking about East Portland and how we might be able to shape these regulations to kind of tailor it to that uh, area of town as well. Thank you. And Lori is the one that was she's still advocating for this. We're having more uh, required commercial. So. Um, that's why I brought it up, and I'd really like to find out more about it. that. Thank you. So I'm going to just cover um, a few other quick notes and then wrap it up. Um, we wanted to just allude to the fact, and you're going to talk about this more in the next item on your agenda, but that we are changing and, and uh, proposing to uh, increase uh, transportation demand management requirements for mixed-use buildings. Um, this is in tandem with the TSP proposal. Um, Unlike the way that the, the, the proposal is handling colleges and hospitals in the campus situation, we're proposing an off-the-shelf, non-discretionary plan that, that a mixed-use building could adopt as sort of their first um, way of handling this and only requiring a discretionary review for that, for a non-standard alternate plan. And so recognizing that we don't want to cause mixed use to go through an additional hurdle of transportation and else where, where it isn't currently required. Um, the other thing I want to just briefly mention is that um, 
oh, in tandem with this mixed use project, PBOT has been and continues to work on um, refining their residential parking permit concept, which was um, crafted in response to parking issues in growing mixed use areas. And so um, we see the mixed use zoning proposal as, um, again, in tandem with that um, in terms of how to better manage parking in these districts. Um, and lastly, um, a few things that are listed on this screen that you're likely to encounter in testimony, and I'm not going to read through them all. You can look at that at your um, convenience. But um, we have heard a number of issues through the um, discussion draft that we no doubt will continue to hear about. Um, and so I just want to um, outline those. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I realize we're more or less out of time, but just a few maybe. Let's just go ahead, start with Maggie, and we'll come around. We, we'd used fairly objective criteria to map these areas, and what we did is look for, um, as Barry mentioned, a, a continuous segment of low-rise storefront commercial that was lower in height um, and, and had that continuous character. Um, so that's what came out of the mapping process were, were the areas listed on the map. Um, some of the areas in northeast um, don't currently have that continuous low rise character. The buildings are already higher in many of those areas. So, I mean, their objective standards, does it need to be objective? I mean, shouldn't other parts of the city take on more density and more FAR and more space to hold commercial, more commercial, more residential the space? Inner, the inner southeast district is the district with the highest amount of growth potential in the plan right now. So I just want to be clear about that, that it is actually taking more density than, than inner northeast. I, w I would also add that this isn't the only place where we've mapped that lower intensity zone. We kind of have used, it was used to, to kind of uh, transition down to residential areas. So you don't see that mapped here, but you'll see areas that are lower intensity commercial that kind of taper off to the edges of neighborhoods in, in North Portland and, and East Portland as well. So. so I see some of the ideas in this last update that, sorry, some ideas in the last update that I like, but. You correct me if I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong. It seems like every single change would tend to make housing less expensive, more unpredictable, and take longer to do, or, or one of those three things at least. Um, and I'm wondering if that's an accurate assessment. Um, it's, it feels like I mean, stepping buildings cost more money. Um, design review takes long, longer, it's more unpredictable. Um, and so although I, um, and I, I, I worry a little bit that the affordable housing bonus is window dressing on a general kind of like par or down zoning. So I'm, um, I'm curious if I'm reading it, reading that correctly. Um, and if I am, even though I'm not the happiest about what's happening in these multi-dwelling zones right now, I think there could be improvement. If the overall impetus of this change is to get fewer more expensive units, then it's gonna be hard to be excited about it. Uh, well, first to be clear, this is the mixed use commercial zone, so this, what we're talking about doesn't affect the multi-dwelling zones. Oh, sorry. I um, yeah, and then um, it is a big part of the project, as Barry outlined, was to um, provide better context and design standards because that's one of the loudest concerns we've been hearing from the community over the years about infill um, and, and new mixed-use buildings. Um, so that is a big part of it. And... Um, we have tried to address the affordability issue by looking at the performas of, of these um, standards and what could be built under these standards. And, and you know, the, the step back, step downs are one example where there's a discrete cost difference. But in general, we've modeled them and to make sure that they're economically feasible. And I think what you're going to find is as you, you know, devour this and, and get to enjoy all of it um, is that there's going to be trade-offs, just like there is almost on everything that we bring to you, and that, yes, in order to provide for better design and to provide for more light and more air and, and some of the green things, 
that we may be giving up a little bit or we may be causing it to become um, a more expensive process. And that's the same thing you're going to hear about within a year or two on the design overlay uh, zones and expanding those to other places in the city. Um, there's a huge call for that. There's a desire to have it be that Mike doesn't have to go to Seattle to have um, great you know, uh, uh, mixed use zones that he's looking at. Um, but the trade-off is real. Um, and that's kind of you know, part of your role is to, is to weigh those things. I also want to emphasize that just in response, at least in the medium sized zone, we tried to shoot for an allowed by right FAR that accommodated a pretty good development envelope. So a lot of the buildings that you see on Division Street or in inner southeast are in the range of the allowed already. Um, some of them are larger than that that you see in the ground right now, and those are the ones that would have to go through a bonus to get that. We didn't regulate the unit number, so we wanted to leave that to the market, so we think that that's a step in the direction of, of affordability. And, and we realize that design review does add cost. Um, none of these areas we are proposing to have uh, completely uh, discretionary uh, design review, uh, they would all be uh, afforded the option of the uh, two-track system, so design standards approach. Um, we expect the DOZA to provide some uh, guidance on that as that moves through the process too, but we recognize the issue with that. And I, I just was thinking about how um, we keep hearing about incentives, and so did you think about incentives for storefronts in East Portland? We had a lot of talk about um, different possible bonuses, and um, the the conclusion was the priority was affordable housing and affordable commercial space, um, and so that's where we landed with this proposal. Um, the The center's overlay does take what's now um, does ramp up the requirement for commercial in East Portland above what it is today. Um, so there are, there are places in those center overlays, um, I'm not sure if you have that map um, available quickly, um, and we were uh, conscious to make sure that that overlay was mapped in East Portland. Um, Oops, went the wrong way. <laughs> there, so those blue areas um, essentially have required commercial in them, and so those are the core of the centers. Um, currently, the current zoning that's in effect today does not have that requirement. So this is more of a request than a question, but uh, yeah. I'm, as I'm sure you're aware, the mayor has added uh, a number of, or he's proposed amendments in the comp plan to add a number of streetcar projects, potential corridors to the unconstrained project list that's in front of city council right now. And, I keep finding myself in meetings with the mayor, including one council work session, where we ask the question, you know, do we have adequate zoning to support these corridors? And you know, at the comp plan designation level, I feel pretty comfortable telling him that we do. You know, at, at the actual zoning on the street level, uh, you know, I keep saying we have to ask Barry. Um, so, so now that we see the maps, um, you know, it seems pretty clear to me in some places we do, other places we don't. And, Probably that makes sense because we wouldn't want to go to that zoning intensity unless we knew there was going to be a streetcar there. Um, so my request is, could you produce a memo that looks at those corridors that the mayor has proposed, uh, identify those that would want to be upzoned um, if we had a streetcar, um, and maybe talk about strategy of when the right time to do that would be because, one, we probably don't want to do it before we actually confirm we're going to do a project, and two, there's probably a value capture opportunity. Uh, when we do that upzoning, we'd want to make sure we factor that in, into either the finance for the transit project itself or the finance for the affordable housing that we'll want to be sure to put along those corridors. So if we get a memo uh, for our benefit and also for the mayor's benefit, I think that would be really helpful. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, so speaking about um, upzoning, up designation. Maggie, can you speak in your microphone? Oh. It's hard to hear you. Sorry. Um, so when you were looking at the analysis, analysis of you know rent potential, et cetera, were there any areas that had increased rent potential or land value associated with overlay zones in the the new mixed use zone? And if so, I think you were alluding to it earlier. Is at what point and can we? capture value in terms of if we're, um, instead of up zoning, up de designate. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the, Barry alluded to it that for the most part, the proposed zoning map is a crosswalk laterally from the current zoning map. So there was very little um, up zoning. There's a small amount, and we could highlight that. Um, but for the most part, the, the, the map went laterally for, from what to equivalent zones. Um, and as, as um, Eli alluded to, the design standards do effectively put a slight downward pressure on what's currently allowed. Um, so the new zones are slightly below the current zones in allowed density by right. So there isn't a lot of opportunity for that, but we can certainly highlight the areas where that has happened. Yeah. Go ahead. Why don't we come down this way then, Andre? Okay. Start. Okay. Um, First is the um, discussion on 80%. Um, in our comp plan, Housing Bureau, LTEs are all 60, 0 to 60% is considered affordable housing. 80% and above, you're starting to get close to market rate housing. So um, I, I know I, I'm trying to figure out how do, is 80% housing solving the affordable housing problem and, and I, you're not the guys to answer that question. The the, the equation, Andre, is yeah. essentially a choice. There, there's a couple levers we can pull. Yeah. The percent is one of them. Okay. The amount of bonus we're giving is another. Yep. Or the percent of the building that we're requiring to be in that affordable unit is another. Okay. And so, um, and again, if someone's going to use the bonus, it has to be financially more financially attractive than not. Okay. And so. The calibration is to make sure that it is. If it isn't, people just won't use the bonus and we won't get the units. So the um, unit, so, but is the unit itself 80% affordable or is that just the calculation to get the bonus? So, I mean, is the actual person in there, could they be zero to 60 in affordability relative to creating, getting the bonus? That'll they, depend on the Housing Bureau's program, I guess, and whether they want to put additional subsidy into th things that have achieved a bonus or not. But you could layer it so that someone's getting a bonus, but then they're getting deeper affordability through through some other program. That's okay. that's some of the so, details to be worked out. So the, that's the, the trade-off, though, yeah. was in order to get to 60, um, we had trouble making that financially work unless we give a substantially bigger FAR bonus, and that it yeah. started to get into territory that was probably not acceptable to the surrounding neighborhood. I, I understand the, I guess the economics of it. My, I guess the question that I'm looking for, and I don't need the answer today, but I guess I need the Housing Bureau to tell me there is a strong desire, even from the inclusionary zoning, at 80% developers are saying, hey, we have a bunch of people we can pile in there. And that relatively is, if you listen to some of the testimony in Salem, those are the desirable people we'd like to see in our developments. And so I'm trying to get to, we have a zero to 60 problem, that is the 80 to 90% of the iceberg affordability problem. And how is the Housing Bureau, I know it's the mechanics, but how is the Housing Bureau going to, are they buying down? Because I'm, I'm concerned that we create a standard and we all pat ourselves on the back. We are solving part of a problem. And at the end of the day, we've actually made the problem worse. And so I, I, I'd like the Housing Bureau to come back with what's their mechanics to get to help solve the the problem they're complaining about. Right. And part of that answer is how this fits in with the inclusionary zoning piece, and, which and, we don't yet have an answer We don't to. have an answer, but they, they need to set the stage because this is truly, I mean, it, it's a foundation here, and it's a, it, it's a big brick for me. If, if you support this, there needs to be a follow-on step because without a follow-on step, um, it's not affordable housing. It's just market rate housing that developers are going to build, and we're not going to. We're the corridors are not going to be what they get to, and it gets to part of Chris's question around streetcar because the mayor has proposed a lot of streetcars in East Portland, and the TODs come with that, and and this would be along those corridors. So Andre, on that, and Chris's question, and some of the other questions, we'll put together answers, and then. 
If you need more information, which I'm guessing you will as you continue to read okay. and you have more questions, we can either have one-on-one -on -one meetings with you. We could set aside an hour at an officer's breathing, briefing. We have until May 10th yep. for the hearing. So okay. but we want to make sure as you go through these that you're getting these questions out and um, that you're yeah. calling uh, probably Eric directly um, with the list of questions, and then we can put them yeah. together. I, I think and staff, get the Housing yeah. Bureau to no, come and answer yeah. your question. I, I think staff has done a great job of creating the foundation here, and I applaud you for really setting up that conversation that I want to have around affordable housing and how do we solve the problem because this is a good, I mean, it's more than a good step. It's a great step forward to say, We've put value on something, and we know what that value is, and now we have a capture mechanism. But we need to make sure that that capture gets to the right people, I guess. And that's the other question is about the um, green bonuses or the green requirements. And um, this is kind of to Mike's um, eco roofs. Um, I, I, I guess. Why do we have so many options, and why couldn't we not um, scale them down to just a few, including eco roofs? Um, it, it seems like eco roofs are maybe. Jump no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm all for them. I actually, I'm like, why can't we just require them? But why, um, is there a reason that we have so many? We we started with this that that part of the code very loosely based on the Seattle Green Factor approach. Without as many of the complexities of the point system and all that, we just created a menu and tried to make the menu loosely equivalent. But that's an open discussion for you all to have, is how many of those do you want to have and what, what level of choice in that menu. Seattle's version has even more choices and is, has a really complicated calculation system that we um, thought was maybe a little over the top. But, um, but it, the fundamental idea is to give you some options and um, a menu of, of ways to green the development and make the, something on the menu required. Do you have any questions? No. Uh, I'll just, Mike. Well, just for the record, the, the design issues that you brought up, I really applaud. I think, I think there, there are two huge issues. Well, one major one, and that is acceptability to, to uh, folks who live in surrounding neighborhoods. So I, I, I personally like it. And we obviously need to address um, affordable housing issues, but I don't think we need to dumb down design standards either in the process. So, and I like more options than fewer. Yeah. <laughs> I want to jump in. I, I feel like I want to just make a statement that I, um, I know I have really good friends who live right around the corner from these commercial districts who've grumbled about the size and shading of development. And I also have really good friends in the past week who told me they got the 30-day notice, 90-day notice, and asked me if I have any rental units available. And so although I, I like the design consideration, I know that was one of the reasons for this Coney update. Um, if it's putting us backwards in the affordable housing department, that's the last thing we need to do right now. So I'll respect sort of the motivation between this, behind this code update. But um, this just doesn't seem, I'll speak for myself as a sort of former affordable housing background. If this puts us backwards in the affordable housing department, then um, that's, that's not going to be consistent with my priorities. So I have a few items, and then knowing that we're short on time, we'll just kind of work on more of a follow-up for them. Um, I would like to have the economics behind the kind of how you've studied the corridors kind of sent around us, so some of us who decide to be wonky with them, we can kind of get into the weeds on it. Because um, I, too, am concerned, and I've already expressed that to you about the setbacks. Um, and where I'd also like to know is if there's been any discussion about instead of the setback happening on the half block or the block at the corridor, if we've kind of considered how maybe that could play into middle housing and actually stepping slowly back into the neighborhood to treat, to look at maybe a multiple block transition so that the corridors could actually take advantage of the full height and bulk that we're giving them. Um, it is expensive to do the setbacks at upper levels. The ins and outs along a street edge, not so much so. But when you start putting steel into a wood building, it gets expensive. So kind of just that's why I want to see the economics and kind of maybe talk about if there's been discussion about maybe it, I know it includes up density kind of along the edge of those commercial corridors as you're stepping down, but it might also present opportunities to support streetcar and create more housing that kind of creates that transition in other ways. Um, and then last but not least, it was just a minor piece. Um, right now, the way that we have in our building codes, as I, I'm sure you're aware, seven stories is not going to be attained um, in wood construction, which means we're not going to get that extra bonus. 
on those CM3 zones at seven stories unless we can solve the construction issue. So, um, and I'm happy to kind of keep help, helping with that. I've been kind of trying to work with the building department to see if that there's a path there. Yeah, on that point, we, we are aware of that, that, and that plays into some of the bonuses too because the bonuses um, at the top end become a little bit less attractive because of that issue when they crash into the, when the bonus floor area that you're earning kicks you into steel, you aren't going to do it. it. And then a similar issue with the parking when you, when your when your additional bonus units kick you into more parking requirements, the, it's a reverse incentive in some cases. Oh, yeah. So yeah. those are Good some point. interesting economic discussions. Absolutely, and just a quick one for you, Andre. I too am in support of more options um, on the green front than fewer. Um, with that, I think let's go ahead and move right on to the next item, which is a hearing for the transportation system plan. I want to let anybody know who's here to testify that there's cards in the back of the room. If you'd like to testify and haven't yet, please fill them out and bring them up to Julie. I also want to give our group an opportunity to express any conflicts of interest if you feel you have any. Okay, great. Welcome back, Peter in Denver. Thank you. Hello. So we're just going to talk for a few minutes um, to kind of recap some of the testimony that we've received and also kind of follow up on some of the things that came up at the last hearing. Perfect. Yeah, so we had our, our last hearing on March 8th, um, which was the first hearing of the, the TSP update stage two, and now we're at the second hearing. And uh, we've received a number of uh, uh, testimony both prior to the 8th and also since then. Uh, the majority of the testimony has been from Hayden Island residents. And that was an issue that we talked through at the last hearing. Um, but I wanted to follow up again uh, just to um, address some of the other concerns that have come up uh, through testimony that's been written to us. Um, so the, a few of the clarifications. So we. We talked about the, the pathway along the northern edge and how that was amended by council um, with the Hayden Island plan. And just wanted to clarify that the staff recommendation now currently does not propose any change to the alignments of the bike routes on Hayden Island. The ones that are already adopted within the transportation system plan um, as per the adopted um, Hayden Island plan uh, council ordinance. The transportation system plan at that time in 2009 was actually formally updated uh, by comp plan amendment with the adoption of the Hayden Island plan. So this included the street classifications as well as the, the, the bicycle classifications. And um, so, in two so we talked about the, the fact that in 2009 at council, they removed a segment of the Hayden Island pathway on the eastern end of the island. Um, another thing I wanted to clarify is that there are no projects proposed for improving the pathway on the northern edge of Hayden Island within either the transportation system plan for, to 2035 or the Portland bicycle plan for 2030. Um, so there's not a project. The bicycle plan did um, update the classifications citywide. And in doing that, they removed the off-street path as a classification and replaced it with a city bikeway or a major city bikeway classification. <laughs> But again, what we're proposing in this update of the TSP is not proposing any changes to the bikeway alignments that are already adopted within the TSP. And um, the, um, it's fully consistent with both the Hayden Island plan um, that was a process of two years of uh, um, uh, development as well as the, it's consistent with the Portland bike plan for 2030. So I just wanted to share that. Thank so you. Let me make sure I parse what you just said. So what you're saying is that the, the Hayden Island, you know, the, the path around the edge of the island um, is the same in the current adopted TSP as in what you're proposing. There's it no, was adopted by comp right. amendment in the TSP right. in 2009. So the, the plan you're proposing makes no change in that now. It proposes no change to what was so The adopted. actual document that's in front of us would add a segment, and you're going to have a staff proposed amendment that would right. fix that, right? So we're going to consider that sort of an That's amendment. what we talked about last right. time. Right, okay, so, great. 
Are there any questions for staff before we move into testimony? Or one one got other Peter? update I've we wanted to share, and that's on TDM. Good evening. I'm Peter Hurley, a senior planner with the Portland Bureau of Transportation. I'm here to provide a very brief update on the transportation demand management chapter of the transportation system plan. At the March 8th hearing, we heard strong support for expanding TDM from TriMet, Multnomah County Health Department, the Bicycle Advisory Committee, Pedestrian Advisory Committee, Northwest District Association, amongst others. We also heard questions from a hospital representative and a request to add TDM objectives from Northwest District Association. Wanted to let you know that we have been meeting with stakeholders over the last several weeks, and we are committed to continuing that process of meeting with uh, stakeholders to address questions and concerns that come up. Uh, we do want to uh, recognize and appreciate Lewis and Clark's letter supporting that process. We also heard PSC questions on who has approval authority and where those decisions can be appealed. Uh, I have a memo from both the Bureau of Transportation and the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability providing those answers. I'll hand that out now. After today's hearing, uh, Bureau of Transportation will develop a response to the TSP and the TDM comments and questions. Uh, and after reviewing public testimony, I anticipate we will provide you with additional recommendations. So part of the uh, uh, recommendations that are in the TSP, uh, based on public testimony, we may have additional recommendations for you. At the end of today's hearing, my colleague, Denver Agarda, will provide you with a timeline for our responses. Right. Um, just clarification. Um, so the administrative rules, it says city official for PBOT. That would be the city engineer. So uh, just tell me the, the context that you're, are you reading from the, uh, I'm reading the memo? I'm reading from the memo. And tell me which paragraph so that I can make certain um, that I'm. Our administrative rules applicable and pursuant to the rulemaking authority expressed delegated by council. It's a city official or council. So is that the city official would be city engineer? So in many cases, it's or the director. The director. Or, in many okay. cases, it's the director. Uh, the director can, of course, uh, ask for recommendations from the city engineer, or in some cases, could even establish a committee to make recommendations. recommendations. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. You bet. Any other questions? Do you guys have anything else before I try to cut you off again? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to do so. <laughs> okay, great. With that, we'll get started. Again, if there's anybody who'd like to testify, please fill out a card in the back of the room and take it up to Julie if you haven't already. Could Chris uh, Schwartzkopf, Alistair Roberg, and Tim Helsner please come up? I should probably also make note that um, testimony is limited to two minutes, and so um, I will politely be kind of encouraging you to wrap up if we start seeing the red light blink. All right. Um, I am Chris Schwartzkopf. I'm a resident of the Hayden Island um, manufactured home community, and I'm. bear with me. I've just heard of this whole plan in the last few days. Um, and so this is the community that we live in right now. This is this is good. And according to the plan that I've seen here, this row of houses will be gone. That's 40 feet from the edge. They, there's no way to move any of these. Most of them would have to be destroyed. Um, their mobile home is kind of a misnomer. These are manufactured homes. They're site built. They're built off-site and brought in, and set up, and that's it. Mine's been here since 1975. It would not. It would not move. Um, this whole park 
is, is affordable housing. Most of the people in this park, probably 30, 30 to 40% are in fixed incomes. So if you were to take this row of houses out, the park would probably not be viable and you would lose 500 affordable housing. So um, just in those few things, I don't understand how a bike path is going to help Hayden Island. The traffic uh, to get to Hayden Island is also an issue that um, bike people would have to deal with. So, I mean, just to, just those few things. Um, thank you. I, that's about all I can do. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> oh, hi. I'm Commissioner. This. My name is Alastair Roxborough, R-O-X. It is an X. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I'm a Hayden Island resident for about three and a half years. Um, you know, Denver did not mention about this egregious loss of low cost homes in order to make the plan that's in this document um, come to fruition. And it really doesn't matter if it comes to fruition um, next month or 20 years from now. The fact is that with this plan on, on the map, it's like a lot of other things about Hayden Island have been on hold ever since the CRC bridge project was cancelled. You just look around Hayden Island and you will see the impact of that, that big weight in the sky that's sort of suspended over the island. Nobody knows what direction things are going to go in. This North Hayden Island bike plan is a bad idea. Um, the displacement of homes is really a serious problem. Um, Oregon's statewide planning goals um, reflect values consistent with home ownership and they direct the state and local governments to provide for the housing needs of all the citizens in the state. Preserving existing affordable housing is the best way to meet this goal. And I submitted a testimony last night by email, and I'm just sort of drawing out a few um, um, points from that. This bad shore-hugging um, bikeway um, comes across more as a recreational um, fantasy than a, a serious transportation route, because the managers, the owners of the manufactured home um, community have said that if, if this has to go south and they have to pull out, which they will do if that line of homes, about 120 homes on the north side of the island and the south side of the island and some in between, if they go, the, home, the whole park will have to close. It won't be an economic um, unit any Thank longer. you, Alistair. Thank you. So um, please protect our shoreline and um, take this plan off the table. Thank you. Thank you. Please Good hold evening. your applause. My name is Please hold your applause. Go ahead, Tim. Good evening. My name is Tim Helzer. I'm a resident of Hayden Island. It seems to me that you are on the edge of an environmental injustice. What I'm talking about is 500 families in a low-cost uh, manufactured home community who will probably be homeless once this plan goes forward. We understand that there's no project proposed, there's no money available, but you know as well as I do that if a plan gets approved, projects will come, money will be found. 112 units will be removed. Those 112 units to accommodate this bike path provide 50% of the revenue for the owners, the Latrec uh, management company owners of this park. The park will become unsustainable economically. The owners will close it. Where will those 500 families go? Many are disabled. Most are low income. How's that gonna look? $2,000 bicycles ridden by cyclists wearing $500 spandex outfits, 
whizzing around an island where 500 families have been removed. You want those headlines? Think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. The question. Yes, please. Tim, don't take off, Tim. So I just want to, I, I don't take your concerns lightly, but I want to be clear about what you're asking for legislatively. I, I believe what you're asking us to do not is to, to not adopt something new, but to roll back something that city council adopted in 2009. I think you know, staff has admitted that the area around the two bays was essentially drawn in an error, but the designation of the rest of the path around the island occurred in 2009 by city council. So you're, you're asking us to roll that back. I understand that. Clear? One of the things that this plan is predicated on is the Hayden Island plan mm -hmm. that assumed that we would have a new I-5 and a new I-5 bridge, which is still way up in the air. All of the infrastructure planned was based on that assumption. So you have a Hayden Island plan that has never been realistic. The day it was adopted, it was all based on the assumption that there would be a Columbia River crossing, there would be a 20 lane freeway through our island. Didn't happen. And I, so, so why would you proceed with a, with a bike plan built as part of a, 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 another Hayden Island plan that's never worked in the first okay. place? So I'm, I'm not going to try and answer that question. All right. I, I do think we'll get to it in work session at that point. You know, I'm going to ask for Michelle and Andre, who I think were around for the Hayden Island plan in 2009, to tell us what the debate was about then. Um, but I, I guess I will draw the connection. I'm not sure that I see what the presence or absence of the CRC tells us about giving access to the river, which is really what that path is about. So thank you. Next is Luke Gilmer, Terry Parker, and Rebecca Hamilton. Go ahead. Hi, I, um, I am here this evening just to um, advocate for a bike path that goes through a neighborhood very close to here. Um, it's been on the TSP project list uh, called the Lower I-405 Path. It's a, it's a bike path and a footpath. It's in the um, Portland Bicycle Plan uh, 2030 with a very similar name and also um, on the 2035 Comprehensive Plan. And it was only when I um, was glancing at the TSP draft for major bicycle routes, um, and this is in a document that I've mailed to you, that the path is missing. And so my only ad adv advocacy this evening is just to see if we can consider this path as an inclusion in one of the major bike paths. So it. Um, the draft, it's kind of hard to see. This is the Google map. And so it allows, um, there's many connectors on the TSP major bike path right now coming in from Barber and so forth and from Twilliger. And there are other ones coming in this way. And this particular path links across. And um, it doesn't displace anybody. It is along the I-405 corridor in the green belt. It's been on the plan, I'm aware of, at least 12 years, 13 years. And so I'm hoping maybe as a consideration, as a major bike path, it may actually get built. I think it's been on the plans in the city for over 20 years. Um, right now, this university district, which is where we live, we probably have about 2,500 residents, most of whom who are students. And biking is a big deal. And it would be great to be able to have this inter interconnect right now. Um, and it does link all the major overpasses of 405. So that's it. Thank you, Luke. Do you need a copy of any of this? Cool. Can I just Thank follow you. up on that real quick? So two points. One is that um, it was my impression that all the classifications that were in the bicycle master plan substantially were transcribed into this plan. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is, is it? possible that the reason you're not seeing it is because it's actually in the central city plan because we drew a donut around the central city and the bike classification for the central city are in 
that plan, not in the comp plan, and I think or in the TSP, and I think your path would be right on the edge. So we're sure right on the, the edge. Wrong map? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're right on the edge, right. and ho hopefully we're in one or the other. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks. Any other questions? Terry. Thank you. My name is Terry Parker. Uh, I live in Northeast Portland. Welcome to Fantasyland. No, it's not Disneyland. It's the Portland Transportation System Plan. The plan exemplifies the standpoint of Bernie Sanders and the posture of Donald Trump all rolled up into one. It guides a complicated, convoluted, and elaborate taxpayer-funded Ponzi scheme to fund alternative transport modes, echoing from a car hater mindset. This includes extorting and siphoning off motorist paid tax revenues to provide free transit passes to employers and spending gone wild with over $800 million to accommodate free-loading bicyclists while all reducing automobile capacity. Car trips are expected to increase by 49% over the next 20 years, regardless of how much mass transit service is added. Road diets create more, conge more congestion and add to emissions. As an example, the road diet plan for Foster Road, which will likely allow TriNet buses to act like big bullies to other traffic by stopping for passengers in travel lanes is projected to add three minutes to the average travel time. Given the number of motor vehicles that use Foster Road, that's 1180 hours more a day that engines will be running and, idle and running longer and idling in traffic. If that were to happen to Sandy Boulevard, it would be a disaster. I'll skip the next part and not only do uh, TriMet uh, two axle buses do the heaviest damage to Portland streets, but public transit on average uses more energy per passenger mile as measured in BTUs and creates more emissions per passenger mile as measured in CO2 than driving a fuel efficient car. Without a more financially self-sustainable fare structure and without adult bicyclists paying their fair share or their just share own way with user and license fees, the TSP is no different than the bullying of a big kid taking school lunch money from the smaller kids. With little or no proportionate motor specific money from with, 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 I'm sorry, I lost my place. With little or no proportionate motor specific representation in both developing the TSP and on the PS, PBOT advisory committees, primary financial stakeholder motorists have become the recipients of discrimination. With the absence of equity, where is the TSP fantasy land uh, reality check. My Thank neighborhood Terry. has uh, recommended a blue ribbon committee to uh, follow this and should have received or will receive testimony on this. Thank you, Terry. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Rebecca Hamilton. I'm here tonight to support the inclusion of working from home or telecommuting as a mode to be discussed and promoted in the TSP. And I know that the TSP usually deals with driving trips and active transportation, and we don't usually think of something that is technically inactive non-transportation as something to include in a TSP. But I think this mode deserves discussion because it has a significant effect on all of the other modes. Um, telecommuting is an extremely effective and cheap way of reducing congestion, greenhouse gas emissions, and traffic injuries and death. In the last 14 years, this mode has been the most successful at keeping new commuter trips off the road. 35% of our non-drive alone trips were work from home. And of 122,000 new commuters we gained, full 23,000 of them were working from home. Furthermore, this mode deserves recognition as a non-driving commute mode for people who are physically unable to bike or walk or don't live in a part of the city that is well connected by transit or bicycle networks. Different options work better for different areas and for different people, and that's what our transportation plan should be about. Our city average for this mode, mode share was about 7.6% in 2014, according to the US Census, and that's better than Seattle. That's uh, 6.7, um, but I think we can do better. I think we should shoot for 10%. Um, and I think that we can make that goal with some relatively simple and inexp inexpensive policy changes and programs. I would suggest um, education and outreach to our biggest employers about the benefits for them for telecommuting, offering telecommuting to their employees. The biggest barrier to working from home is cultural. And so communicating the benefits um, of increased employee productivity, fewer sick days, and less employee turnover would be a good way to start at that. We can encourage a one day a week telecommute for government employees. It's a huge employer and there's some control there. 
Friday is our most uh, traffic heavy day. It's also when we incur the most traffic injuries. Um, so I would advocate for a citywide um, or a city promoted work from home Friday. Um, Can you wrap it up, Rebecca? Okay, yeah. And then finally, the one physical piece of infrastructure that I would, um, that I would suggest would be to implement a citywide fiber optic internet cable um, system, which is something we want to do anyways. So, thanks. Thank you. Any questions? I appreciate the work from home um, advocacy and would say that if you look at the zoning code right now, the amount going from a type A to a type B home occupancy takes almost nothing. It, it's, I think there, there's lots of opportunity there to, to um, make it a little bit easier to have home-based businesses. Um, and you probably find it in the residential section of the zoning code, which I think might be up for um, some opportunities to update that. So I hope you keep working on this. Thanks. Thanks. So Eli, just to follow up on that. So if you're, as I am, an employee of somebody and you happen to work from home, that doesn't even require type A permit. You can just do it, right? That's, that's, I believe that's right, yeah. If you have, I think the thresholds are having one, any, if you have any employees at your house, you can't do that. I, you can have one employee with a type A? Can, well, maybe this is a departure from this discussion, but I, I, when I last list, because I, I, I work for myself basically out of the house and violate the rules on it sometimes. Um, and it's so easy to violate the rules that, that it makes me wonder whether um, they're, they're written the way they ought to be. So I, I'd love to look at that a little bit from the zoning code perspective to see whether the rules are written in such a way that um, it's very hard to legally have your home business. Great, thank you. Next is Michael Robinson, Dave Bodine, and Matt Meskel. Worked out well, we got you all up here together. Thanks, we appreciate that. Um, Chair Schultz, members of the commission, Mike Robinson again on behalf of uh, Providence. So I brought some reinforcements with me today that <laughs> probably will be able to give you more information than I can that you really want to hear about, which is what a good job Providence is doing with its TDM and bicycling efforts. So let me just take my less than two minutes and, and just say a couple of things. First of all, I've given you a letter that has more in it than I want to say uh, this afternoon. You can read the le letter. But Providence really has three main issues, and I recognize some different faces, so not all of you are here perhaps last week, but here are three main, or two weeks ago, here are three main issues. We're concerned about the use of administrative rules uh, to guide the TDM. If that turns out uh, where the electeds believe the rules ought to, the uh, provisions ought to reside, we just want to make sure that the rules are uh, adopted and amended in a way that the public's aware of, not just us, not just Providence who can pay a lawyer to go find it, but for the public. Uh, secondly, we want to make sure that if the rules are amended in the future, that they're, you, you under, you're going to get notice, you understand when they're going to get amended. That's our biggest concern about using administrative rules as opposed to something in Title 33, just the ability to get to it, to, to influence the process and, and to find it. Secondly, uh, we want to make sure that the TDM doesn't turn into an opportunity for my brethren to make this more of a contested and inefficient process. We're all about doing a TDM and we share the city's goals in getting people out of single occupancy vehicle cars and using other modes. The process we're headed down, I think, is actually going to result in more contested case hearings, which is not necessarily a good thing. And lastly, we want to emphasize the ability to use proven and effective TDMs like Providence has now. So really, if you could sum up what we're interested in, we, we want to get the same place the city does, but we want to find the most efficient way to do it that doesn't turn it into a land use arena. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Julie, we were short on the amount of letters that he passed around. Did you get a copy? I have a few more if you need them. Okay. I'm just trying to uh, cover my bases. I've got a few more. I'll give them to you, Julie, before I leave tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Michael? Dave? Dave. Hi, I'm Dave Bodine. I, I work at uh, Portland Medical Center just up the road here. and. Uh, uh, part of my responsibility is. Can you bring the mic closer? Is this better? Yeah. Uh, my name is Dave Bodine, with Pro, and I work at Prob Portland Medical Center just up the road here at Interstate 84. And part of my responsibility is to uh, uh, manage the parking and the uh, transportation demand management issues. And in the last couple of years, we've done some incredible work and uh, created a new uh, comprehensive management plan, uh, which we're currently implementing. We'll be hiring. Uh, very soon a manager 
Uh, so that'll take some of the work off of me, which I will really greatly appreciate. But there's a couple of things that uh, you might know, you probably know a lot of things about Providence, but a few things I, I would like you to know is um, some of the things that we're currently doing, uh, free TriMet passes for all the employees. And we have uh, partnered with uh, TriMet on routes and frequencies. A bike pedestrian coordinator who is uh, Matt right here to my left. Uh, preferential carpool and dedicated uh, car share parking, uh, telecommuting options, and uh, uh, work hours, uh, compressed work hours, 10 hour shifts, uh, and they come and go during the off peak traffic times, uh, which I think is really important. We have a transit uh, center shuttle that runs from the uh, Providence Park to uh, uh, the hospital and back. Uh, we have electric vehicle charging stations that have been on campus for about four years now, uh, cycling facilities, and uh, something that's really important uh, for us that are, are in a neighborhood setting is uh, through the uh, neighborhood association agreement, which is a formal thing. We, uh, uh, we meet on a regular basis and we have a transportation work group also. So we're staying uh, dialed into what are the issues and uh, what do we need to do next. Thank you, Dave. Hi, I'm Matt Meskel. work at Providence Portland Medical Center. I am the cycling coordinator. Providence Portland Medical Center is a silver level, level bicycle friendly business with the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, the Providence Portland Medical Center has capacity for 180 bikes on campus. Our Providence Office Park has capacity for 95 bikes. Um, the PPMC capacity has also recently expanded. Um, Part of my role as cycling coordinator is I uh, distribute a cycling newsletter to encourage people to cycle to work. I maintain and uh, built a transportation themed website with pages dedicated to cycling. I maintain a bike buddy network to encourage uh, new people or people who are hesitant to ride to work um, where experienced riders can accompany them and help them plan a route. Uh, I lead periodic rides with leaders where we get executives to bike commute and um, we sort of do a bike train and pick up people along the way. I started with Prov Portland with the BTA's uh, Bike Commute Challenge. That's turned into a statewide role where I lead um, all the Providence teams in the Bike Commute Challenge competition. Also, just at the tail end of last year, picked up the Drive Less Connect. I'm the administrator on that site. I'm just in the process of getting that going. I collect bike count data, and um, that led to the expansion when I determined that we had one cage that was constantly at capacity. We needed to expand that. And I worked with a local bike shop to have them come on site and do free bike checkups. And that's it. Thank Great. you for your time tonight. Thank you. Um, looks like we have some questions. Go I ahead, Andre. Just one question. So your issue is your your plan is good through 2023, correct? Correct. And so your issue is the future after 2023 and that you don't know what it, that future is. I never know what that future, future is. And that, yeah. that is our issue. We're good with, with our existing PDM, okay. Commissioner Baugh. But the system that's at least in front of you now in both Title 17 and Title 33, I guarantee you is going to end up having numerous land use appeals. And I, I mean, frankly, as a lawyer, I love it. As my client, we'd rather spend our money on taking care of people's health. So we're concerned about what's going to happen after our, after our current CUMP expires. Okay. So here's my dilemma. And, and I, I, we set a climate action plan that has goals that I remember all the health organizations, Gary probably remembers, came in and testifies, including Providence said, we want a healthy environment. We want lower CO2 emissions. In fact, we included in the Portland plan health requirements for neighborhoods to mm -hmm. be walkable. And we put a hierarchy that puts cars below bicycles, transit, and walking. Um, so I, I'm confused of why you support a climate action plan and, and to get to that climate action plan, we have to improve the TDM. We have to somehow reduce driving. 
I, I'm not sure how, but somehow we have to reduce CO2. And part of that is through that. And at the same time, we, we didn't know at that time what the rules were going to be, but everybody was champion. And because of that, this climate action plan, we got a mayor to go to Rome and Washington, D.C., and everyone's patted us on the back. And so what's, what's changed between four years ago on a climate action plan and when we were developing well, that, and, uh, and, and everybody said, including Providence providing testimony that they're encouraged to support a plan. And today, if we don't do the TDM, we don't meet the goals that you supported four years ago. Well, um, nothing's changed. So I, I'm a little, um, let me try and say it this way. Um, we're. Providence as an institution supports what they've always supported, which is what you just described. The, the issue we're having is how we're going to get there. And we think there is a clear and objective way to require us, well, first of all, uh, I'm not sh I don't think there's a reason to throw out an existing TDM that, frankly, if you look at the information we gave you tonight, which includes two documents from Julia Kuhn at Kittleson, there's no reason to throw out an existing TDM that frankly has been extremely effective in doing just what you described, getting people out of their cars, causing them to walk or bike or use transit. The issue that we have is how do we get there? It's not, it's not a dispute about the climate action plan. We agree with that. Uh, please don't tell my client I'm opposed to that because I'd have to go out and find another client. So I, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> not, not and, and our testimony point. shouldn't be construed as that. What our testimony is about, though, is, is the, the, the regulatory mix we're seeing is one that's going to end up having us um, go through a, a discretionary land use process where, uh, where if, if we don't perform in ways that different groups expect us to, we're going to end up in a type three appeal process. And that's for as little as four parking spaces or 20,000 square feet, or we can do one big program at the beginning, we're going to have the same issue. So I think our concern, Commissioner Baugh, is about how we do exactly what we all agree should be done. And we want you to think about, if you would please, developing Title 17 and Title 33 rules that encourage the use of an existing TDM, at least as long as it's doing what it needs to do. And I think there can be a checklist that does this. And also trying to be develop a system that uses clear and objective standards so we don't necessarily have to go through a land use process. You don't get a better result by going through a discretionary land use process. I think you get a better result by making sure that the mechanisms you have in place actually get you to the place you want to go. So we're not, we're not disagreeing about, how, about where we want to be. We're, we're trying to have a conversation about how we get there and focusing on actually getting the TDM to work as opposed to having the same kind of land use disputes we've had in the past with the CUMP, which is where we thought we were moving away from. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question, by the way. I, I appreciate that. Okay, I think that's All right. It. Thanks a lot tonight. So we have one last testimony card. If there's anybody in out there that would like to testify, please fill out a form, bring it up to Julie. And in the meanwhile, I'll call up Michael Duro. I think I'll stand up and make it easier for people to hear me. Um, my name is Michael Duro. I currently serve the people as a director on the MESD, which for those who don't know what it is, is the Multnomah Educational Service District. Um, I'm a resident of Northeast Portland. I've lived there for 36 years, uh, and I intend to live there for a lot longer. Um, for disclosure, I want to say that I am currently a candidate for Portland City Council, position number four. Um, I only have two things. I want to advocate for far more shared housing models. Uh, Portland doesn't really have a, a lot of what you'd consider co-op housing. There's this, you know, there's, there's, there's condos, but then there's co-ops where people own part of what they live in and not necessarily all of what they live in. Uh, and uh, I wasn't able to print out the, the information I had for you. 
so I'll, I'll try to send it in the mail. Um, and the other thing I want to I want to speak against is against use of city funds to subsidize 80% medium income housing. Uh, this the housing that needs to be subsidized needs to be at least 60%. The 80% those people are so close that they're not going to be overspending their. Uh, it's 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 I think it's a bad use of funds. I would rather see half the half as many 60% housing as units as 80% housing units. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Is there anybody else that would like to testify? Doesn't look like it, so we will close the hearing. Do we have questions for staff? Do we want to call them back up? Yes, no? I would like to get um, Peabot up here yeah. just okay. for one qu and question. Can I just ask a process question, Madam Chair? Um, are course. we holding the written record open for any period of time to give people a chance to get last comments in? I don't believe that was the intent. Um, are you concerned about that? Have you well, heard concerns about that? We've done that recently on a lot of projects. What if we want to give people a handful of days to? Let me ask staff in terms of the timeline of, because it has been open and it was noticed for today as the right. last day. Um, do you, either of you three? I was looking well, at the we have a process. Process. We yeah. will talk about process. Yeah, so um, I, what was the question again? Just to so be clear. I'm, I'm worried. Of, I'm just wondering whether or not uh, if you're going to be have time, if we leave this open another week, or if you just want to do it until you know so three more days or yeah, until Friday, Friday or something like that. If we had to leave it up so until Friday, is that fine with you all? Let me lay out just kind of the, t the timeline as we see it going to okay. April 12th, which is when we have the, the final work session. Um, Denver, so, Denver, can you speak into the mic? It's a little yes, hard sure, to hear. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so right now it's the 30, the 22nd, um, we are, you know, looking to April 12th, um, to, um, have the work session. We want to be able to provide any, um, staff input on any recommended amendments that you have. Um, we want to be able to compile the amendments and have a clear, um, uh, I guess, uh, staff response, um, so that you have that to work with. And so what we were thinking of is, um, working towards the um, planning commissioner's officers briefing on the 31st um, to be able to have, um, to, to receive any amendments that you have in mind so that we have time basically a week or so to be able to give you staff responses in advance of the April 12th hearing, which would mean that, so we were targeting the 31st, the end of this month, uh, as a, a deadline or a timeline to be able to get any amendments so that we have the time to provide staff response. So Denver, would it be a problem if, if people could provide written testimony till this Friday for you? No. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my one question is on this administrative rule, which seems to be a hanging point. Um, so is it your proposed process on the administrative rules for the TDM to have, um, uh, I guess, participation from the stakeholders and comments, or is this just going to be a closed-door session of PBOT? I'm just trying to understand the process to get to what these rules are. And, and I, you don't need to answer it, but I think it would be good to have in your response uh, going forward what to clearly articulate that rulemaking process and who might be involved in it, and how it might work. Good comments, and, and I will reiterate that the, the Bureau is committed to a open and transparent process, engaging, we, we have and we will continue to engage stakeholders in the process. And I, that, I hear your question about more clearly articulating that process. It'd be good to have it on paper that you're gonna hold three meetings, they're gonna include these people, and the director will do what, and then there will be a decision. Or however that's going to work, I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'm just looking for something because it seems to be a sticking point here. Yes. Of no one knows what the the process is and if they have input. Very good point, and uh, we will respond. Thanks. I just add in. I would just include in that how that process gets revisited 
in the future because I think part of the concern was, you know, everybody's watching it right now and they see how the rules get developed, but they could change along the way and people might not be aware that they were changing. And then I don't know if it's in the material that we have already, I just haven't gotten to it, but a rationale for why you're going that way with the proposal as opposed to standards within, in the code sections that were referenced would be helpful. Um, one more thing it, it, with Michelle's uh, question is, is it, I, I didn't see it in your letter, but is this the first time you've done administrative rules this way as PBOT? Definitely not. Uh, <laughs> there are a number of administrative rules, and okay. uh, there are, the city has also been moving to have a more uniform process for administrative rule development, okay. and we quoted in the uh, uh, the memo that I handed mm -hmm. you earlier some of the specific sections, but I think we can we can also lay out what are some of the other administrative rules that the Bureau has in the past adopted? That would be good because I think there would be good to know what else is under in within your purview that people are still um, may not know or be aware. Will do. Thanks. Yeah, but in the memo we got, um, status of the PPD states, I don't know what PPD stands for. The Portland Policy Documents, uh, that's a repository for administrative rules and other uh, similar types of documents that are not part of a land use code or uh, one of the other titles. Apologies for the, uh, the acronym. Okay. So, it, so when it says documents are not land use decisions, this is like a collection of non-land use decisions and as determined by the... Um, City Council or is it determined by a legal precedent or like how, just so I understand like how, what's the, how is it defined what's a land use decision what's not a land use decision? I guess that's what I'm trying to find. Come on up. Uh, so um, a land use decision is something that is um, related to the use and development of land and there's that's the simplistic definition but there's hundreds or thousands of pages of case law that basically defines what is and isn't a land use decision it's kind of like one of those quacks like a duck standards that that people will debate but um the assumption is you don't write land use kind of codes in an administrative rule you put that in the zoning code and you put things in an administrative rule that are likely to change often and need frequent updates either due to technology or changing circumstances or things like that so there's always the there's kind of that three levels of regulation within the city and within most public um, within most cities that there's kind of the the code and then there's administrative details that sit at a layer below that and the portland policy documents is the city's way of being transparent about that, of saying that if it's not in this repository, it's not a rule that we enforce. <laughs> we can all talk about this at another time a little bit more, but but mainly is, and Michelle will, can weigh in on this too, but is <laughs> when it's behavior change, which is getting someone to walk, getting them on their bike, not building the bike lane, that's a little bit of a differentiation in terms of is it land use or is it um, something that can be in the administrative rules. But Chris, I've got a, a few questions, and uh, yeah, I, I put a number of comments into the written record to kind of tip my hand on where, where I may be looking at amendments. Um, probably be useful to to plan a meeting with staff for early next week to talk specifically about uh, amendments to the bicycle map because I, okay. I expect to have a few, yeah. uh, and I'll want input from staff on that. So maybe we could look at Monday or Tuesday so you have everything pinned down for the thirty first. Um, to the testimony today about um, work at home mode share, um, as I indicated in my written comments, I'm a, a fan of putting that in as something to have a goal around. Uh, my question is, in terms of how we calculate mode share today, is that going to shift both the numerator and the denominator? I'm, I'm guessing that we don't count those as trips today, so we don't give them part of the mode share. So if we start counting them as trips that didn't happen, we're shifting the base of trips that we're calculating from. Is that, just trying to think about how to think That's about correct. it. correct, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, 
question about um, Hayden Island, a different question about Hayden Island. I'll ask the big question about Hayden Island in a minute. Um, the mayor and his work on the project list is, is also, I understand, proposing a, uh, an arterial bridge project to Hayden Island as a you know, potential replacement for the CRC. My question to you is, should we adopt um, a, a street classification for that bridge? Will that be helpful as part of the plan if there's going to be a project that says there's going to be a bridge? Should we decide what kind of classification it should have? And would you have a recommendation about what that classification should be? So you can think about that. Uh, and then since you know, we're, we're ahead of schedule, rarely, um, if Commissioners Baugh and Rudd were interested in sharing their recollections of the discussion around the 2009 Hayden Island plan and that pathway around the edges of the island, I'd, I'd love to be edified. So. Um, I did re um, resurrect the meeting notes, so that's my recollection. Um, and from the meeting notes, I, there was this broad discussion of a path and the need to be near the water um, because at that time we were increasing density on the island and, and that density was going to literally double. So there was this idea that we, to draw a line and to figure out the details later because we didn't have we had didn't have the opportunity to really say what that might look like i i from the meeting notes i don't think we actually talked about removing housing at the time um yeah um i think we just talked about it's a line we'll figure out the details <laughs> later but without the line we were not going to have the opportunity to have bikes along a river and we had, we had struggled with having bikes along the river in the main corridor of the city and in some other areas. So that was kind of a philosophical discussion, I, I guess I would say, as best I can um, read from the notes. Yeah, Mike. Let's go ahead, Mike. Yeah, well, it, it seems in, inconceivable to me that the city of Portland would be removing those homes to put a bicycle path in. So I'd like I, I'd like to get a little more clarity and, and on the reality of what's being um, discussed tonight. And right now, all it is in the TSP is a classification, not only for bikes but for pedestrians. Um, it's a it's a pathway classification in our TSP, and there's no, as I mentioned, there's no capital project, which means there's really n no initiative of the city to actually build that project. Um, it's, again, an aspirational line. I think recognizing in part that the, the east-west uh, opportunities um, by bike in particular and walking are on the busier arterial streets. And so it provides a quieter, more low-stress, attractive option for the residents on the island. And um, so there's. Uh, no scenario I can think of where um, this this project would uh, result in removal or of our displacement of homes that are there. Um, right now, it's an aspirational line, which most likely would potentially be implemented if um, the uses of those sites along the river were to change. Are there so not other creative ways to solve putting a bike path besides on somebody's property? along the river well, whether you could afford them or not I, is a whole other story <laughs> but I, I mean it goes along with I'm whether not, you can afford to demolish yeah, homes I'm not sure <laughs> I, I in part what we're doing as staff is we're honoring the, the process the two-year process of planning and working with the community to develop the Hayden Island plan um, and that's the uh, the um, that's the recommendation that they came with Planning Commission and was adopted by council so we're trying to stay consistent with that makes sense so it's the basis for concern that we were hearing, the fa just the fact that there's a line on the map is cla uh, puts a, a, the specter of the potential for a, a trail diminishes the value of the property potentially, or I don't... Well, I, 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 so I heard that maybe it potentially increases the value of the property yeah. to be... Re I mean, this was the spandex. The, 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 the line drawn appears to go through some of the mobile homes and I think 
I don't remember and I don't remember us ever talking about removal of homes. It was just to draw, as Denver said, an aspirational line on a map that just said, if in the future by some either development, redevelopment or something, because we were talking more about redevelopment of Hayden Island and and um, what we, how many units we could get on the island if we had the opportunity. Here, here's where we'd want a, a, a bikeway or something like that. And how that came about was not really part of the discussion, at least according to the notes that were taken at the time. We, um, we can come back when we come back for a discussion at the meeting when you're actually going to vote on this and, and lay out what we, from the, no, the minutes that were taken at that time and also um, provide additional information about um, the discussion that got us to that point. Again, it doesn't mean you... There are times when something has been adopted by council and you can come along with the next plan and disagree and put that in your recommendation. Um, but we want to clarify whether the intent is to actually have anything go through those properties. And at this point, that is not the intent. I think it'd be important to make sure that's really clear. Yeah, um, are there any other questions for staff? Well, I'd like to answer something from Chris. Can looks I like just we have finish up on that one? Is the new the new member of this body? I'm I'm not always sure how far reaching our decisions are, et cetera. And so I, I you know, kind of over explain that one when you're talking about those the houses, because um, you know I'd like to really get a, a a sense for okay we approve this. Of course, obviously I know it goes to city council after we approve, but. Um, what is the actual what will the actual impact be at least in the short term and then maybe in the midterm and maybe in the long term um, because I don't necessarily have all of the scenarios in my head at this point so that would be really 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 helpful to me is South That's, waterfront a good example of a line that was drawn and then Eventually, it became a path. Exactly. Yeah, okay. we had, a lot of our riverfront pathways were um, uh, originally aspirational lines that were drawn, and then uh, redevelopment occurred. Went from like South Waterfront industrial use private to um, higher density. It's it's an it's a good example. I mean, I think uh, the um, the the one thing I really want to be clear about is we're not proposing to add a line if we. Um, in the in the plan, we're just being consistent with what's already in the TSP. And but so, is is what it means is that if the area is redeveloped, a condition of redevelopment could be to add the line. Is that that's just that's the the impact of it? Yeah, that's the kind of thing. That... Yeah, a, a, a current example would be that there's the, the line for the Springwater Corridor runs right through the Portland Spirit dock facility, and you know the owners of the Portland Spirit have been you know clear that. Uh, aside from you know their dead bodies or eminent domain, <laughs> it's not happening while they own the property. And yeah, it, it's been a contentious issue for probably a couple of decades. But that's the worst case kind of situation you could probably wind up in, and hopefully, you know, comes out way better than that. <laughs> go ahead and go ahead, Gary. Can I borrow your mic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is. I think kind of a techno geek question, but um, I was intrigued by the um, table 11.1 .1 and the, inter the interim regional mobility policy. And can you explain a little bit more what what that's about and what to, where's the controversy or where's the discussion around that? Maybe the simplest thing to say is that um, the regional transportation plan was updated. I think this was added in 2007, or sorry, 2010. Um, and as part of us being in compliance with the regional transportation plan, all local jurisdictions are required when they update their TSP that to essentially incorporate that table. Um, and so what we're doing is we're incorporating that table. At the same time, we do have um, a desire to develop alternative mobility standards, and that's part of what Peter outlined in his um, in the section. So, are the mobility standards a different way of expressing the degree of over peak overload? It's volume to capacity is the 
I'm sure yeah, sorry, it's volume to capacity is the measure that's used. Yeah, so it's basically the demand versus the supply. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Chris mentioned. So I was, sorry, um, Courtney Duke, Bureau of Planning, uh, sorry, I keep saying that because I'm here so much, uh, Bureau of Transportation, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, uh, Okay, well, I was here for my beginning of my career, but um, I actually am putting on my uh, different hat to talk about a little bit what Chris had mentioned and Rebecca Hamilton related to the work from home trips. Um, I'm on the city's uh, uh, diverse and empowerment uh, employees committee, and I'm also the chair of the Working Moms Group. And one of the things we've been talking with Commissioner Fritz and uh, Director of HR Anna Canwet related to the paid family leave, but what are some other things that the city can do to have more family-friendly policies, and one of them is a work-from-home policy. And um, and we talked about the mode splits and the things that we're trying to do at a transportation level and at a higher level. And I think uh, Chris Smith would be interested, too, that, I mean, there's not a lot of um, systems in place, both uh, electronic and cloud or um, process or other types of systems in place at the city right now that makes that easy to do. So I think from putting that hat on... Um, you know, your discussion and Rebecca's discussion about the work from home and, and tying it especially to some of our other mode split goals and other bigger uh, planning and transportation goals is a, a great move and there could be some ways to influence some other city policies and other city processes to do that. So that's my non-transportation moment. <laughs> so, yeah, so to, to expand on that a little bit more, I, yeah, my belief, in, and I'm a work at home commuter, you know, 95% of the time, um, I think the, the challenges to getting there are, certainly there's some technical that we're providing the systems that people need, the information systems they need, but cultural, largely. Correct, are, yes. are managers comfortable working with yes. an employee they can't see, right? Very much, yes. Uh, and you know, in, in my world, I have you know, three employees in Wilsonville and one in Rochester and one in London. So you know, I've gotten used to dealing with employees I can't see. And I think as we get there, it, that attitude enables this but I think the larger category is, you know, from a, you know, from our climate action and other goals, the trip avoided is nice. a win, right? And the way we talk about mode share now, we just stop counting the trip avoided, right? We don't count it in the win column. And I think what I want to find is a way to count it in the win column. Um, so if we can think about how to do that, I'm happy to propose an amendment that, that gets us there. Are there any other questions? I've got... Um, Two items, um, and then um, I'm going to beg my fellow commissioners' pardon, since we still have time. Um, I'm going to reopen testimony for um, one individual who has um, arrived and had hoped to testify, and then we'll close it back up, um, but still allow for written testimony. Um, but I thought we'd get, get through all of our questions so we don't have to call you back up necessarily. <laughs> um, so one, my first question is I'd like to just um, kind of hear some consideration for the notion of, uh, in your, when you're looking at your TDM options in the future for somebody like Providence, if their current TDM plan or you know meets your goals, is there an option on the table that says yes, we would accept the the, the current TDM plan? Um, so just one question, uh, something to consider. And then there was a fair amount of uh, written testimony regarding Northeast Seventh. And so just kind of um, would like to hear some follow-up as to whether um, that's being considered or why it's not being considered. Yeah, a lot of that testimony came up in the last couple of days, so we've been trying to get it uh, in front of the right people. Um, right now, 7th and 9th are both classified for the bike route. Um, so that's those are two very closely spaced bike, bike routes. I think the question is uh, one of them is a major city bikeway, um, 9th. Um, for a segment in Northeast Portland. Um, the other one is just a city bikeway. Um, and I think the, my understanding from the, the testimony is that they want, there are some that want to emphasize 7th um, over 9th, which has some trade-offs because there's more vehicle traffic on 7th. Um, and so that if you were to make conditions really comfortable for riding in the road, you'd have to really reduce that traffic probably. So I think we want to um, kind of mull that over a little bit and think it through. I think. There, there may be some um, potential uh, proposals that we could we could bring. Um, so, the one that I think could be discussed is um, whether one of them is the one that's the major city bikeway is the right major city bikeway or the the other one. Um, 
So right now it's on ninth again. Seventh is the one that they're uh, advocating for. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, so with that, I'm going to reopen the hearing on the TSP. We have one individual who would like to testify. His name is Brad Perkins. And I guess since it's open, if there's anybody else that has shown up and that would like to testify, please fill out a card and bring it to Julie. Thank and you, Brad, Catherine. you've got two minutes. Thank you, Catherine. I hope they have more minutes just to talk more about Sullivan's Gulch, uh, where it's at, uh, where it's not going. Um, first of all, uh, forget about 7th Street being a corridor. Uh, that is nuts. Uh, it's, I'm not going to get into it, but 9th makes much more sense. I live in that neighborhood. I know all about it. The other thing, uh, Sullivan's Gulch, let's talk about that for a second here. Um, the problem that we have right now uh, on uh, was it July 25th, 012, is when the city council approved a conceptual plan that uh, I, Lynn Coward, sit in the audience, and a number of others worked six years to make happen get the money, get the city council to approve it after CH Doom Hill worked on it. Okay, where is it now? Nowhere, okay? We do finally get the stars on the map after this comp comprehensive plan is approved, but what about the money? Um, I am willing to get out there and raise uh, private money to help make this thing happen, but we do need uh, the city to step forward with initial money, not next 10 years, these 10 years, because what's happening is at the Joe Angel property, at, at the, uh, uh, on uh, MLK in Grand, that's going to be developed. 21st, uh, we had to go to Luba in order to get that appealed, in order to have the city understand that, you know, you need a connection on 21st that makes sense, not down in the hole. We need to bring it up as far as we can to the new development that's being planned there. 33rd, we lost the connection there already because of the, of the uh, Soviet block building that was built there. And now uh, they want to build another section, which is even worse than the Soviet block building. And that's going to be on 32nd. Uh, we we're talking about plans there at the Hollywood trans Transit Station. Um, all these sort of development opportunities could be used for tax increment financing. We would really like to push the city into uh, looking at that being an urban renewal district and maybe that being used for the construction. But right now we need engineering money. I need to just yeah. finish that up. Thank you, uh, Brad. Okay. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you because um, I've been working on this for a long time and I think that we need a freeway for bicycles that's safe. Okay, that connect all the north-south traffic. If you want to put Portland really on the map as a bike city, that's safe to ride a bike for all ages, young and old, Thank including you, Brad. myself on the old part, so. uh, then that's what we need to do. I, I do have a question for Brad. So, Brad, I, I share your enthusiasm for the project. Um, you know, money is always a challenge, and we're not here at this table right now engaged in, in the money part of this. So the question I have is, um, do you need anything in the way of classifications to keep this project moving forward, or have you already got what you need in the comp plan and the TSP? Um, it seems like if we can get the stars on that, make it a permanent part of the land, land use map, mm -hmm. I think we're okay. Um, but it only goes out to, um, right now, excuse me, uh, Gateway. What we'd like to do is eventually get all the way out to Multnomah Falls, okay? And it can be done if we stay along I-84. Okay, so it'd be good to be looking at the comprehensive plan for the next edition from uh, Gateway out to the, the boundary, the east boundary of the city. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. anyway. And uh, thank you because I had to weigh my priorities whether I take my wife out to dinner for her birthday <laughs> <laughs> or go to this meeting, so I did both. <laughs> I'm, good. I'm glad to hear your wife's happy. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, and with that, I will close the hearing again on the TSP. Um, we will make a note that written testimony will be accepted until this Friday, which is the 24th, 25th. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>